In this video, we're gonna show you how to do your own DIY bathtub and shower renovation and save a ton of money. So the first step of any renovation, of course, is demolition. Now that's a fancy word for take out the old stuff. So what we've got going on here today is, let's just talk real quick about some safety equipment. Um, I got these awesome gloves of the color of my football team. It works. Uh, you're also, if you're a homeowner, you're going to want to get some, maybe some eye protection. Working with this tile, when you're working with it, you know, you get a shard or you're going to get cut edges. You want to make sure you're being smart about it. Another good thing would be to get a mask. A lot of the reasons we're ripping these bathrooms out is because we got mold in behind the walls. This is an N95 mask. It's for particulates. This is especially good for dust and mold spores and that sort of thing. So you buy three of these for 10 bucks and they'll last for the entire length of the renovation. Make sure you make that investment. And if you don't own a fancy pair of gloves, I grabbed these from the store today. These are five bucks. This is a leather palm, leather backing on it. Great investment if you're DIYer, one size fits all. So I would suggest those as well. Now, before we get into this, let's talk about the process. Demolition, of course, is just the removal of what was installed in the reverse order. And if you follow that advice, everything will go well. But before we get started, rule number one, turn off the water. I know that you have control, you can turn off the valve and all of these wonderful things, but you never really know what's behind a wall. So to protect your home and your investment, just turn off the water and open the taps at the top of the house and open the taps at the bottom of the house, drain out all the lines and get rid of the pressure. There we go. We just hear the air rushing. So we're cleaning out the lines. Now we know when we renovate, we're not gonna be able to cut a line and have a pipe burst on us. So if we're ripping out the bathroom, you need a few basic tools here. One is a tub remover tool. You can find this at your hardware store, plumbing department, about 10 bucks. A uh, screwdriver to turn it, a couple of different bits. Usually the Phillips head and the flat head is about all you're gonna run into. Got your drill and you're gonna need your Allen keys. Now, most of these tubs here, they have a set screw on the bottom. You can't see it, it's in an awkward spot, but you need to know it's there so you don't drive yourself crazy trying to unthread this or rip it off the wall. Until that set screw is released, you can't remove this. So why don't we just start there? Um, this is a Delta system. It's an Imperial system, of course. So this is a 532nd bit and you gotta go underneath here. So we go to this side and usually one twist is enough to release this darn thing. Yep. All right. So now you can see it on camera. It makes sense, right? That sits right in there. Now you can stick this in a whole lot of different places and be very unsuccessful. So be patient with it. Turn it a little bit until you feel it sit in the seat and then you can give it a turn. All right. Of course we have the shower valve. Usually these handles have a decorative cap on it and you can just use a screwdriver to pop that off. But it has a set screw as well. Now that that's out of the way, there's usually a couple of screws on the plate. These older model systems always have surface screws. The newer ones, there's a wall plate that gets mounted and it snaps in, but that makes that simple. So now your wall can be removed without interrupting your plumbing, okay? Secondly, we wanna remove the overflow in the waste now. Usually just one or two screws here. The idea here is the plumbing behind the tub is gonna stay in place when you remove the tub. So you have to disengage the trims here so that that can happen. So here's my fancy tub remover tool. And it has got two different functions on this depending on the size of the tub. This, the short end goes right in there nice and snug over the crossbars. And the way I do this is I lay a screwdriver across the top, push down, and turn counterclockwise. Now in the older tubs, because it's steel, they usually just use plumber's putty to put these on. This tub strainer basket is so recessed, my tub remover tool is of use. Zero, useless, not gonna help. All right, I gotta have to show you another trick. So that is amazing. That's the first time ever my tub remover tool didn't work for me. I'm not sure what's going on with this, but uh, you know, not everything is created equal, right? So 
we got a couple of tips that it might work for you. You can use two really thick screwdrivers, or you can use what I got here, a couple of old Allen keys, great big ones. Here's we go. And I'm going to show you two tricks here. One of them is you just put in the Allen keys, okay, and then you create this cross again, and you can force like that, and you can unthread it that way. Now this only works if the crossbars in the bottom of the the tub drain here are intact, okay. And you can see that works quite well. And you can put as much force as you need to on that and unthread it. If you have a tub strainer here that the crosses have eroded away or rusted away, here's another thing you can do. Realize that this is a chrome plated material. It's usually a soft metal like a brass. You can take an old chisel, put it on the edge of that, and kind of go square on just to create a dent. And then you can lay it a little flatter. And you can just tap it around. That takes a lot of time, makes a lot of noise, but it is effective. <laughs> I, uh, I'm not sure how to remove a tub if you don't get this out. Because now you're connected to the house's plumbing. If you have to remove this and you can't remove this in strainer, you're going to use it cutting tool or a torch and cut the tub in half, I don't know, unbelievable. So it's good to have a couple of tricks up your sleeve. And voila, renovator one, bathroom nothing. All right, so all shower heads are created equal. They usually have a little shower arm and there's a compression fitting on this as well. So if you just give it a little bit of a turn and a pull, you can get this out of the way. All right, now there's got a couple of options here. You can just grab right in here with your pliers and just turn it. And you're probably gonna just take the shower head off. Okay, and then you can try giving this a turn. It can be a little bit frustrating because the guy that put this in originally usually used a lot of force. Okay, so get a good grip on it. And then once you get that started, you can just kind of finish it off by hand. Of course, if you're stuck and the wrench isn't working for you, you can combine this with another trick that I know. You get the wrench on there nice and tight, throw a screwdriver in the pipe. It gives you extra leverage. And you can pull both of those at the same time. There's no way that that went on strong enough that that won't work. So once we've got our fixtures removed, the next thing is to get rid of all the silicone joints that are around here because we're going to be removing the walls next and that is a lot easier to do if they are not silicone to the tub. Just grab your knife and cut. The ceiling doesn't appear to be... Yeah, it is siliconed and painted. So we want to cut that loose as well. All right, so now it's time to remove the walls. And if you've grabbed your sledgehammer or one of these beautiful Stanley bars, you've got the wrong tool in your hand. <laughs> like I said before, this is more surgery. So we have to be smart because what we want to do is we want to reinstall the new tub surround in the same space without creating a mountain of work repairing walls. So the technique that you want to use here is really simple. Grab an old flat chisel and a hammer, and you want to remove this tile one at a time so we have control over the wall, and hopefully we don't damage the wall board so badly. And you can see tile chips, so make sure you wear your glasses. Working like this allows us to cut this wall board right beside the old painted line and then we can create a tile line from the same spot on the wall so we don't have to repair all the drywall and repaint. Now, if you've never done this kind of work before, you need to understand 
that when ceramic tile breaks like that, it's not the clay that's dangerous, it's the glaze. This glaze is razor sharp. So make sure you're wearing your gloves. Now I can create a cut line and I can cut right down the drywall and we're ready to remove the walls. Okay, so here's the deal. If you're a home renovator and you're working on your own house um, and you don't want to be dressed up like a clown with a diaper on your face, you know, you realize you're taking some risk, okay? So uh, for me, I'm not a big fan of wearing the mask. Let's get rid of that. And I'll tell you why. I find wearing the mask makes it really hard to breathe. <laughs> and to be honest with you, I guess I'm a little old school. I kind of believe like whatever you do for a living is going to kill you. So, you know, you can try to take all the safety precautions you like to avoid injury. That's one thing. But I'm not going to worry about a little bit of dust now and again. Uh, if I'm working in a real dusty environment, I set up negative air and I'll wear a mask on occasion. Uh, I'm gonna cut uh, eight feet of drywall now with a reciprocator. It's gonna make a little dirt. And uh, if you're afraid of dirt, then don't renovate. <laughs> uh. You'll see here, I'm just gonna cut about one inch back from my finish line. This is outside of the tub. It's not necessary to have any kind of waterproof board here. So that's why I'm cutting at this point. And the other way to do this is with a knife. If you don't have one of those fancy tools, you can always use a knife. Now, looks like the last renovator that was here used a green board. It's jointed right at the same spot as what we're doing. And then they taped it and did a bunch of mud work. So I got a half inch of mud to carve through first, but if you're patient, run this down a few times. It'll eventually work right through to the back of the drywall. Okay. There we go. Whew. I'm going to show you my technique for removing the tub surround walls. No, you don't chisel off every tile. I actually had someone comment in the section below about, could I just remove all the tile with a chisel and then tile again on the same wall board? And the answer is no, for obvious reasons like this. The surface protection, that paper that's been treated for the anti-mold and the water resistance, it's going to get damaged, okay? It's not worth your effort to try to save anything here because I'll show you how, you'll see in a second. You saw how hard it was to chip away at this. I can remove the rest of these walls in less than 10 minutes, okay? So bear with me and watch the technique. And it's real simple. What we're looking at is just smashing holes right through everything in the same swing. Okay. So here, that's a, that's a stud. That's a stud. I've cut the wall board away. Because I'm wearing my safety glasses and my gloves, I can get in there and reach in and grab it. Now just use your, your force and now use your hammer and just shake it. It'll jiggle all of the drywall screws that are in this board loose from the backside. All right. Generally, it comes out in one piece. Things like this tear off. Okay. Now, You can just walk that right out to your garbage bin. So a lot of homeowners I know have the same kind of problem. What to do with the garbage? They don't want to pile it up in their garage. They can't put it on the curb for the city to pick up. So here we go. We're going to show you a little secret. I got to do this quick before my bag blows away. <laughs> ah. 
All right. If you've never seen this before, this is dumpster in a bag. You can buy this at the local building stores. It's a brilliant little invention. Comes with these two straps. All you gotta do is lay it out near your curb. And when you're done, you call the 1-800 number that's on the side of the bag, pay with your visa over the phone. These guys will come by, grab an arm, scoop it up, take it away for you. The whole thing full, I can put an entire bathroom in there. Tub, toilet, walls, floors, the whole thing, including the vanity in the top. It's about $250 for removal. Brilliant deal. If you want to get a roll-off bin, you risk damage in your driveway, it takes a lot more space, and usually start at five or 600 bucks. So this is perfect project size. So a quick trick here before you start pulling off all the walls to help reduce your scope of work when you're done. Remember the, um, the ceiling here, there's going to be a drywall joint. The tape will go from here up and then across. And if you're not careful to cut through the paper before you rip off this wall, you'll peel it off the ceiling. Then you're going to have to repair the drywall and repaint the ceiling again. So we try our best to avoid that from happening. We run our knife across here a few times. Almost like we're trying to cut it right through the drywall. Because lots of people use a lot of mud in the corners. You want to make sure you got that paper cut. All right, now it's right back to the same technique, only different. And just give it little tugs, little vibrations. Until all these screws are popped loose. All right. And then once we've got it kind of separated, we'll downward force so that we don't damage our ceiling. There we go. So here's the edge of our ceiling now. That is perfect. There's absolutely zero damage here. It's exactly what we're looking for. Uh, when we go back with our new wallboard and tile, our new tile is going to be thicker than this old stuff. This is what we like to call biscuit. It's really thin. The newer one's thicker, so it'll actually have a thicker profile, and that is going to put us in a position where we're going to finish clean on that ceiling, no rework on the ceiling. Whew. There's another whole day you're not going to waste. I get a lot of people asking me questions about this sort of situation here, this black and the insulation, and they ask these questions in the comment section below. And <laughs> what you want to know is this is not mold, right? This is air movement. And when air is moving through a building cavity, it's going to pick up whatever dirt is around and it's going to deposit it wherever there's resistance. So this is just air movement, probably because it just wasn't sealed up tight enough on the back side of this wall. It's nothing to be concerned about. It doesn't affect the insulation quality. It just looks ugly. So if it bothers you, you can replace it, but you don't need to. Okay, so this is an empty cavity. We got plumbing and wiring back here. That's a really deep wall. It's a mechanical wall. Probably gonna have heat runs as well. So here you want to be careful. Watch your swing. You don't want to go all too hard and punch right through here because you might hit something important and wreck it. Remember, keep your mouth closed when you're doing this sort of thing. <laughs> Here we go. Same technique. All right, make sure the silicone is cut. Bit of a vibration. One thing you're going to want to do here, check for nails on the adjacent wall. Okay, make sure there's room for that wall board to open up. And when you get it going, it'll just open like a door. And again, since you're walking through your house, fill up all the broken bits that are going to make a mess along the way. You might as well leave all the mess in the same room so then you don't have to clean the entire home later. There we go. Now, this piece of board is probably about 60 or 70 pounds, so keep that in mind. Um, if you're working alone or 70 pounds is too much to carry, you can just smash across 
and then smash down first and you can reduce the size of the board. Right, so for the top side of this wall, I really like to smash it down into two pieces, tearing out this whole wall and protecting the ceiling while carrying all that weight and not slicing your leg on this cut tile. It can be a trick. So what I would do, let's just find a place where we know the cavity is safe. We'll smash right up that grout line to the ceiling. Now I'm going to put my hammer up against the frame on an angle here so that I can pry it off again. Same thing, All right? You want to pull it down from the ceiling away from your cut line. Well, I mean, it's obvious that there's a lot more to do in a demolition than just taking out a sledgehammer and beating the hell out of it. I know they love to show that on TV, but let's stop and think here for a second. What if we beat the tar out of the wall and we hit the stack, right? You punch a hole in this bad boy. Now you're bringing in the plumber and you're replacing the stack right into the attic. That's attic work as well. What if you swung the hammer here and you punctured the joint in this copper line? If you didn't notice that you did that, you'd put your bathroom back together again, turn the water back on, poof, you'd flood out the entire house. So when you're tearing things apart, if you don't know what's on the other side or inside that wall, which you don't, <laughs> you have to use some patience and a little bit of skill. I know it's great TV, but using a sledgehammer inside a bathroom is really not what that tool was made for. Now, we don't want to wreck the ceiling, so we've got to pull down. There we go. Ah, we're batting a thousand. So far, we've saved the ceiling. <laughs> Remember, when you're doing a demolition and you're doing an isolated project, like we're only doing the tub and the tub surround, it's our job to now stop and think, how do I keep the scope of work from getting out of control? Okay? So one of the things I don't want to do is I don't want to have to start getting into finished carpentry because that's a brand new set of tools. That's a brand new day of work. Oh my goodness. So what we have is an outside corner bead holding this wall in place. So I'm going to grab my hacksaw and I'm going to cut my corner bead. Okay. I'm going to set it and go on a 45 degree angle and you'll cut both sides. There we go. Now when I rip apart my corner bead on my wall, I'm going to leave all the trim alone. There's another whole set of tools and a whole setup. I mean, can you imagine having to set up all your tools to make two cuts? What a pain in the butt. Okay, so now this bathroom here is basically a great big square and they've put the tub in here and added this wall to bring the controls into. This style of construction means that you are going to be doing some mud work and you're going to have to do some paint, but it's only on a tiny little wall, okay? So when you're taking this apart, don't even try to save the corner. Don't try to peel it open to put it back later. You're going to crack the paint line. You're going to make a mess. Just get it out of the way. Move on. It's going to be in the way of installing your wall as well. And you can see here they've done it with nails. Okay. So the best way to get rid of this is actually swing the claw hammer at it right on the corner. Once you've popped it off the wall, you can just give it a yank. All right, now, and you can be as surgical as you want to. Find each nail, pull them out, all right? Make sure it's not gonna do anything fancy. Done. Same thing, just take your time. It's easier when you're going down because it'll bend and break at everywhere the nail is. You just put your claw behind it, and then you pull it out, and then you can pull it down again. And if it doesn't break away nice and clean for you, just throw your claw into the wall board. So you get the grip, and then you can rip it out. And that's where we cut it. Perfect. One more time. Okay. Remember to always close the blade before you put it in your pocket. <laughs> 
Yeah, I learned that one the hard way. <laughs> so the majority of our demo is complete. So before we pull out the tub, we're going to just take a minute, take all the nails and screws out of the wall, clean up any extra debris that needs to be removed. And then we're going to take everything off the floor, sweep, clean out the tub, vacuum. We're going to start with a clean slate again before I start messing with the tub. Because the secret here is that the floor in this bathroom we want to keep, okay? So we're actually reinstalling it with the same floor still attached. So we want to take a little extra care here and make sure that as we go, we're not causing any damage that's not necessary. Again, keep your scope of work reduced. And then this kind of project is very predictable. So the next step in our demolition is we have to remove the tub. But before we can move the tub, we have to cut our plumbing out. And here's why. We're in an alcove situation and this tub won't pull straight out into the room because the frame is exactly the same size as the tub. But on that side of the wall, there's drywall. So I have half an inch too small to be able to slide the tub out. So what I have to do is I have to lift it, roll it, and then slide it in between the, the studs of the wall in order to take it out. And the reason I want to do it that way is because then I'm not affecting and increasing the scope of work by causing new drywall work and new painting going on. It takes a few extra minutes but if you take the time to cut the, the plumbing out of the way then you, and pull all the nails, you have all the room that you're going to need to be able to roll the tub out. And we'll show you how to do that in just a minute. But first, remember we have our water supply off. You just need one of these little copper cutting tubes. And I'm going to pick a spot that's convenient for me for putting the plumbing back together. I don't want to have it anywhere near my wood bracing. Okay, so now we've cut and capped all of our plumbing. It's completely out of the way now so we can move our tub. And you can see the entire process for how to do all this plumbing on our next Copper to Pex video. So the last step that we have before we pull our tub out is we just go around and make sure that we pull out all of these nails and screws. Again, the gap here is exactly 60 inch. The tub is exactly 60 inch. So there's no room to maneuver here if we're constantly bumping into nails and screws. So don't drive yourself crazy. Just take two minutes. So just keep in mind when you're cleaning your wall before you pull the tub out, when you pull the tub out, you're going to want to be comfortable. So you're going to roll it and you're going to lift it up to where you're standing comfortable. So you're going to hold the tub here. You got another 32 inches. So you want to make sure you're, you're pulling all the nails up to four, four and a half feet, just so that you're not getting anything snagged, especially your hands. All right, so, so far we've managed to remove all of the shower fixtures, all of the walls, all of the tile, and we haven't damaged anything outside of our scope of work, which is new tub and new tile surround. So the last thing we got to do before we pull the tub, make sure we cut out the silicone joint down here. And I mean, sacrifice your blade. Get that right in there. You're going to dull off the tip. <laughs> And that's okay. That's why they make them break offs. Okay. Now we've got this moving mat here so that we have somewhere to set this tub after we pull it out. Remember, we're trying to remove the reinstall the tub in the same exact spot without damaging this tile. If we pull this off, we manage to keep this cost of this job down to $3,000 instead of upwards of six or seven. That would be awesome. Okay, so I'm going to attempt to do this on my own for all of the benefit of everyone out there who doesn't have anybody around who can help them out. Um, I actually am pretty lucky here because I don't have a lot of studs in my walls on the end. I've got this stud here and I've got this big cavity here that I can work with. I've only got one on the other side and all my plumbing's out of the way. So I should be okay to find some room to wiggle this out. What I want to do is I want to just first of all start by rolling it forward and then kicking it in so that I break the seal and get this tub away from the tile. And I think I've done that okay. And already I'm getting caught on the drywall over here. And the secret to how this works is you got to give it just a bit of a twist and then get this edge of the tub in between the studs into the insulation cavity so you can slide it over a little bit. You don't need a whole lot of extra room to wiggle one of these out. Just a little bit. There we go. Now at this point, because this is a steel tub, uh, I would recommend grabbing a neighbor. <laughs> Get some extra help carrying this down the stairs. I know there's a lot of people out there. We could probably lift this up and walk out, no problem. But remember the goal here is to reduce the scope of work. 
And putting a hole in a wall on the way down the staircase is not going to help you out with that. Throw it in. Just a note, if you do your demolition the day before garbage day and you want to recycle your tub, the easiest way to do it is leave it on your curb on, for garbage day morning. There's always somebody driving around the neighborhood with a truck picking up metal things to take for recycling. <laughs> We've got a typical situation. We've got a lot of debris here, but I just wanted to point out, once again, here's the stack. Our plumbing line comes out on a 45, comes across to pick up this vent, and then there's a P-trap to here, and then we have this plumbing. And this looks like it could be reused. But here's the issue. Our new tub has got a different body mold to it. So our center line is going to be in a different location. All right, we don't have a four inch ledge on the front with a little edge on the back. So we're actually going to be moving over here a little bit and the back side has got to go up to 20 inches, not 16. So although this looks like this might be able to be saved and reused, the fact is it'll be a lot easier for us to just start from scratch and put everything exactly where we want it. So we're going to leave this in place for now because there is a P-trap full of water. But tomorrow when we start to redo the plumbing, we'll cut open the floor a little bit and cut this pipe off and we're going to establish a brand new plumbing system here for the drain. <sighs> I know it's a bit of a fight, you know, you'd like to be able to save something if you can, but in the long run you're going to cause yourself a lot of problem and this kind of stuff should not be attached to your tub under pressure. Don't try to ever force it in there, that's a sure way to make it leak. So if you're like most people, you're in a home that's got a bathroom that needs to be renovated and you've got it all ripped apart and you're going to run into this, copper plumbing. Now you may not be the best plumber in the world, but if you can learn how to make one simple solder joint, you can convert from copper to using PEX, and then you can just use a crimper to install all your plumbing through the rest of the shower. This will enable any average homeowner to be able to add jets and rain showers and all kinds of fun features, and you can even run your plumbing around the nooks that you want to build on your walls, but you need a couple of simple tricks, and here they are. First, you're going to need a copper cutting tube, this is a really simple little tool. Pick it up at the hardware store, about 15 bucks. And copper is a really soft metal. Actually, I'm going to go a little bit lower. So when I'm torching, I'm well away from the wood. Copper is a really soft metal. You can actually just tighten that tube on. Look at this. And it starts cutting right through. And every time you make a turn around the pipe, you just turn it up a little bit more. They come in different sizes, so if you're in an unrestricted area, you can get one with a big handle, it makes it a little bit easier. But in this environment, just a quarter turn, and then just keep on running. It'll take about six or seven times around, and then you'll be able to cut right through the pipe. Now, if you're good with a torch, there we go, we just broke through. You could always just heat up this joint and pop both of these at the same time. A lot of people might find that a little tricky. So this just kind of eliminates all of those problems. There we go. And tighten that on and just work it around. You'll notice also that this control area is really low. Back in the day, this used to be standard to have it really low because the tub was used a lot more than the shower. Nowadays, people are using the shower almost exclusively. And the times that this functions in the tub is very rare. And so we're putting them up a lot higher, so it's a little more convenient for while you're having shower use. There we go. So now we're, we're completely clear. All we have to do now is identify how they've got this mounted on. Looks like a couple of nails, a couple of nails. This is a fancy little stiletto tool. It's like a little mini hammer, but it, it does so many wonderful little things for those hard to reach places. Now, in this situation, we're not gonna try to save any of this plumbing. So you can be as aggressive as you like because we have drained the water. There we go. And then we'll just lift this up to loosen the nails. And pry that right off. There we are. Now, important, don't throw this away. You're most likely going to want to save this copper to add for your tub spout. And that is a good piece of copper, so no sense throwing it in the garbage. Okay, so we got our hot and our cold. Traditionally, hot's on the left. <laughs> if it's not, you're going to be in for a surprise. Um, what I'm going to show you here is how to clean this, how to torch it, and then how to convert to PEX or just put a, a brass cap on. And the reason you're going to learn both of these options is if you have options, it might save you a trick to run into the store. Now this is sand cloth and it's funny because 
think the last time we did a copper to pex video, I used sand cloth. I called it sand cloth. It says sand cloth on the box, and people were giving me different uh, opinions about <laughs> why I was calling it sand cloth in the video in the comments section below. And uh, it's because that's what it's called on the box, so that's what I call it. If you have a different trade name for it, that's fine. The goal here is to get it nice and clean. You can't torch on dirt. You have to make sure that your copper is copper in color <laughs> before you try to torch anything. And you want to do about an inch and a half. Don't try to just get cheap and clean around the top because all it takes is one missed spot and you're going to have a leak. So here we are. Here is the fitting that we're going to use to convert from copper to PEX. Now, this is plumbing language, we talk male and female. Um, things that get receiving and things that go inside, right? It's the way it works. So this is the male version and this is the female version. The female version goes over top of the copper, okay, which is convenient. The male version is the same size as the copper and so this would be convenient if you're on a joint or using a coupling. I just thought I'd throw that out there for you to see. But what we're using is the female version and because the part of the plumbing we're doing right now is kind of mid-demo, we're just getting this all capped off so we can pull the tub out, I could also use just a regular plumbing cap and I can cap my plumbing that way too. Okay, but since we're going to be converting to PEX for the long haul, what I'm going to do to save myself time for tomorrow is I'm just going to put six inches of PEX on there, put on a test cap, which is one of these little plastic caps here, and that'll be good for tonight. And then tomorrow, we can just cut and add the fittings when we're ready to run the plumbing. Now, basically, this comes already cleaned. It comes from the factory. It's brass. It doesn't really tarnish. But what I like to do is scratch it up just a little bit so that I have somewhere for the solder to sit into. Okay? So when I'm doing my torching, if you haven't done torching before, what I'm looking to do is I'm going to use this solder. Here we go. You heat up the joint where you want the solder to go to, which is up here, and you add the solder from the bottom. All right? So what you want to do is create a nice, clean, scratched up environment so the solder has somewhere to sit. And you're basically sealing it for the whole width of the joint. All right? So you end up sealing it about 50 times more than is necessary. And that is the goal, to get such a good, clean joint that there's no risk of it ever leaking, and then you can sleep at night. solder now. I'm adding the heat to the top left. I'm adding solder for the bottom right. The heat goes up. So when it gets hot enough to melt solder in the bottom right, I know it's been sucked because I added the flux. And there we go. It's been sucked all the way to the top. And that's it. That soldering job is done. So I just ran to the car and got my PEX cutting tool. So I'm out of breath. It's too cold to be standing around in a t-shirt. I wanted to show you this. Two different fittings you use to cap the end of the line. These are called test caps. They're made of plastic. And this is a brass cap. That's if you were going to have a line and it's going to end and you want to crimp that and not ever think about it again for the rest of your life. Not using that today. We will be using these. And they're wonderful. You just slide them on. Okay, get a couple of rings. Slide those on and crimp it. And that's it. So we're going to just stick this on the line and then crimp it all up, okay? Now, we torched that only two minutes ago, but I'm not concerned about if it's too hot. This PEX handles a lot of heat. The way you do this is you would put this test cap on and it has a little stub on it. And you bring your ring right up to the, the end here. And that tells you that you're in the right place. Line on your crimpers and done. Okay, so you want your ring about a quarter inch off the end of the pipe. 
snug to the brass fitting. Boom. And this might seem a little, a little bit tedious and frustrating, but it is a lot quicker and a lot more flexible than doing soldering. All right, so we are back here now to finish our conversion from copper to PEX and install our shower valve. This is the typical shower tub system. It has hot and cold shutoffs, as well as it has integrated PEX adapters so that you can run PEX directly to this. And the tub line comes with a three quarter inch PEX adapter, which solves all of the problems we've been experiencing in this industry, going to PEX and having dripping from the shower head when you do PEX to your tub. So what we need to do here is really simple. It's just a matter of doing any of our, our copper work first so we can let everything cool down and then we can just crimp everything together. So these systems come, the tap just threads off like this. Just be careful, this is all machine brass and it is sharp. You may want to wear gloves for this case. This is just the test cap with the ring on it. And there we go, that's our valve. So I'm going to suggest, since I'm going to go with the copper option for the bottom, I'm going to suggest that you take out the stops for the hot and the cold, just pinch them together and slide that out. Okay, and just give her a tug. There we go, it's all one piece. Now the instructions that come with this do not tell you that it's required. However, experience says when you're using a soldering wet tool, if you have anything on that fixture that's made of rubber, you're probably best to get rid of it. There we go. Oh. And that is why we put the drain cover on. <laughs> there we are. So now there's nothing left here but solid brass. Now as far as the height that you install your valve at, it's completely optional. I'm consulting with this particular client. Um, she has grandchildren that she uses to bathe in this tub, so she needs to be able to access the water while she's bent over at the tub. So it's not as low as traditional for a tub, but it's high enough that you can reach it without having to bend over while you're having a shower. So it's kind of the best of both worlds here. So before we get started, don't forget rule number one, turn off the water, drain the line. Just because you turn it off doesn't mean you're not going to have a mess. The lines are pressurized, so always drain the line first. So this valve is going to go on our center line, which is about here. If you're in a situation where you have more stud space, PEX is awesome. They have these wonderful little holders, and you can actually bend it around to go to a 90 without using a crimp. Okay. In our situation here, though, we're, we don't have enough room to turn that. So I'm going to have to use an elbow. And since I'm using an elbow on the hot line, there's no sense using this on the cold because I'm only going to be able to have as much pressure as on the hot side anyway in a shower. So the easiest way to hook up your plumbing is to use a laser level. Get your laser level on the center line and then just mark all of your lumber where the line is. Okay, all the way up to the shower head. And that's it. Now there's no more measuring involved. Done. Gotta own a laser level if you run away at home. Next thing is to rough in just to measure all your components. We're going to temporarily screw this to the wall. Um, good to know in this system, the, there's two holes for screwing it and two holes for attaching the plate. The ones that you screw to the wall with this manufacturer don't have any threading in them, so they're easy to identify. I know some companies thread all the holes regardless. And this always drives you crazy. So we will put that there. And now for this, you're going to need a half inch coupling for the tub. I like to use one of these bad boys because I can attach it to the wall. It's a 90 degree elbow that comes with the mount on it. Now, way you measure is you measure the gap and then add one inch. So you get a half inch for each fitting. So we're going to go seven. So I need to cut an eight inch piece of pipe and measure my eight inch with my thumb. Of course, this is a rough to met. If you're at all concerned, you can just take off a little bit for good luck. <clears throat> That's fine here. Okay. Leave that there for now. And you also want to cut at the same time 
and about a five inch extension for the tub spout. Now the particular tub spout fixture that we have is a slip on tub spout where the attachment happens near the wall. You really only need about two inches out of the wall. I just like to go a little overboard so that I'm guaranteed I'm not gonna have any soldering on the pipe where I'm trying to slide it over the tub fixture later. Okay, because we're dealing with copper and we're dealing with our hands, we're gonna have oil on the line. We just make sure we clean up the copper, all the ends, give them a good scratch with the sand cloth. Of course, use the fitting brush inside all of the fittings. Give them all a good scratch. Including here. And you want to scratch up the valve as well. Before we continue, we just want to get all of our torch products sitting here handy, ready to roll. One of the best ways to do your soldering is to have your fixture mounted somewhere so that you don't have to be holding on to something that's going to get red hot. Uh, I like to wear my safety glasses when I'm torching because when I get my fi fixture soldered, I like to use the brush with the, the flux and just give it a quick wipe. Okay, it guarantees a good seal and you may get something flashing in your face. So that takes care of that. Now, before we solder, we want to assemble. All right, so we want to get flux inside all of our fixtures. All right, so I put this together temporarily for now. I've got a screw in this elbow so that while I'm heating things up in the, in the, in the, in the sorry, the, um, the flux goes kind of uh, very liquid. A lot of times these fittings will fall off and I don't want all the stuff falling in behind the tub. So this will just anchor it all and keep it all in place until I'm done. I've thrown a screw here to get my water line bent out of the way to keep it away from the heat. So now we're ready to do this. I know it looks a little archaic, but the fact is we're not welding, we're soldering. So, you know, in a perfect world, it's nice to have a nice little pretty joint. But my goal is to get the solder not at the joint, it's to get it inside of the fitting where we scratched it up. Now I've got a scratched fitting and a scratched pipe and solder stuck in all those little grooves. That's what the flux does. It's like a magnet and it pulls all the solder into the inside of the joint where the heat is. So you heat where you want the solder to go. And then when it's hot enough to melt it, it sucks it in. So although maybe a couple of points here, you might see what you think is a pinhole, I'll guarantee you that is watertight. And before we close up the wall, we will guarantee that it's watertight and do a pressure test, so we're gonna be okay. Real quick note, don't worry if you get any of this uh, solder on your acrylic. They do not bond together, and it will just wipe right off. Okay, now, because we have turned off the water, right? Yeah, I'm pretty sure. And drained the lines? Oh, I'm pretty sure. I'm confident because I'm looking over at the bathroom tap and it's open and nothing's coming out. Yeah. Oh, all right. Yay. Yay. All right. So what we're going to do is we're just going to measure how, where we want to be here with the water line with our thumb, just a little bit below. This again is eyeballing and it might be easier if the blade is facing you. Sit it in the cradle. And this is, you want to cut while you turn. That's how you cut it straight without collapsing the pipe. If you just cut it straight on, 
you're going to crush the pipe out of shape like that. And then putting on the fittings is a real pain in the butt. So always add a ring as you go. Okay. And it's not going to stay where you want it to, but that's okay. We also need to add enough to go from here to here. I love the fact that this PEX is covered in numbers because it makes it really easy to measure. <laughs> okay. Again, we can put the rings on from ahead of time because we're going to have two joints. All right. Now, here's one of these situations. Everything is so tight together that we can't connect it. Now, we can take that off and put it all in place. And then we'll throw another set screw on again, just to keep it all in, still while we're working. All right. Same with the other side. Twist and cut. The end is no good to us. Ring. Fitting. Two rings. Connect that. Eyeball it. Cut it. All right. There we go. Then we have to take our trusty crimpers. Now these are awesome. I think the last time we did one of these copper to PEX videos, we used a different locking system. Since then, Crimprite has come out with a crimping tool that is around $40 instead of $400. So it's finally making something that a homeowner can use. So you can use these solid rings to crimp now as a homeowner without a huge investment in your plumbing. Again, this means that you can do your own plumbing and the tools will be a lot cheaper than hiring a plumber. Now the goal here is to get the ring about a quarter inch away from the fitting. All these fittings have these little barbed rings on it. So as long as you're making solid contact on one of these rings, you're going to be fine. But if you aim for the quarter inch rule, you're sure to be good as gold. You know, the scary thing is, plumbers today are using exactly the same system. That seems like an awful lot of money to play with Lego, to pay for a plumber. Now don't get me wrong, I love my plumber, and there's a time and a place to call in a professional, but when they make plumbing systems this simple, man, man, oh man, you better learn how to do this yourself or you're just throwing away your money. Now what we're going to do is we're going to take our valves and we're going to put them back in in the closed position, which is straight up and down. And we will put back our clips. And this is a pretty simple system to install. A little bit of a push. Push that down and then close them into the, into the cradle. You probably see it easier on this side, eh? I just got to push it in, right? Drop this in there. Okay, we are good as go. The last thing to do here, of course, is we have to put in the shower system. Just thread this on. Again, go backwards until you feel it sit right. Nice and gentle in case you're cross-threaded. There we go. I know I mentioned this when I was taking this apart, but I'm putting it back on. You've got to use a pair of gloves here. You're supposed to do this hand tight. You can use a wrench just for a quarter turn, but hand tight is plenty, but wear gloves. All of these machine lines here, if your hand slips at all, it'll just slice you to shreds all around the inside of your palm. And I learned that one the hard way. All right. So now we're at a point where we've got our hot and cold water supplies all crimped on. The shut up valves are back in. Our cartridge is back together. Our tub supply is all installed and capped. Now it's time to do the shower. And this is just a PEX to PEX. This is a drop ear connection. Again, put it on your line and tighten it down to the board. Okay. 
So I'm just going to eyeball it to the perfect cut. Add a little bit. That'll never hurt. Wonderful thing about packs is you can always cut it a little bit long because you can bend it in place. And then just drop it down. Get your crimping tool. Set that to a quarter inch. Well, we now have plumbing. Now let's go turn the water supply on and double check everything, please. Can you all right, so my son's downstairs turning on the water supply. What we do is we get on the phone together so that I can communicate with him if we have any leaks. And the first thing we're going to do is with the, the taps closed, we're going to check our solder joint here and our connections leading up to the valve. And we have no initial issues. Can you go full pressure, please? All right. And we're all pressurized? Okay, come on upstairs, buddy. Okay, so now here's a great little invention that I get at my plumbing supply store. Um, I haven't seen these in the hardware store before, so if you're looking for one, you might want to go to a specialty supplier. But this is just a simple little cap. It has a gasket on it, an extended pipe so that it's easier to cut wallboard and identify things when you're doing your tile work. But it just threads into your shower head spout. Okay, it's exactly the same diameter as the fixture itself. And you just tighten that on nice and tight. Now you can test the pressure in the whole line because I'm capped up here with this and I'm capped down here with the solder. So now we're going to open up the cold water supply. Perfect. We're all finished our plumbing rough-in system now. The final trim goes on after the tile and that's also where the cartridge gets installed in here. The reason they have the shutoff valves on this bracket is so that you're not mixing hot water through the cold water line. I know that there are some systems out there that uh, come with a test cap that don't have the locks. And I've had situations like that where you install your shower and before you know it, a couple days later, the toilet's running hot water while you're busy tiling and such. So these are designed to keep the water from flowing until you get the rest of the system put together. And that's about all you need to know. So in a lot of cases when we're working in a job site, and we're changing the tub or tub surround. The idea here is to try to minimize the scope of work. Unfortunately, in this situation, the client wanted to go from a standard 30 inch wide to a 32 inch wide. And so that creates a lot of little nuances that we're gonna cover in this tub installation video. Because if you can install a larger tub into an existing smaller space, you can install any tub on the planet, okay? So let's get started. I just wanted to point out first before we get moving about the quality of the, of the tub that we're using. This is a Maryland tub, it's called the Tucson. The 32 inch is called the Tucson. This has got an acrylic tub, but it's a sprayed fiberglass reinforced acrylic, okay? This is extremely strong and it's a, it's a little bit more advanced than some of the products that are available on the shelf of the building store. So keep an eye out for this because the price point is really minimal. For an extra $30 or $40, you can get a high quality acrylic tub instead of something that's gonna have a lot of deflection and risk cracking over time. Okay, so you'll notice that this is a little piece of chipboard plywood, reinforced, all sprayed and glued together. But this is the skirt, and this is the translates a lot of the load on the front side of the tub. And when this is all sprayed together with the fiberglass, it makes it incredibly strong. You'll also notice on the back side, there are a series of wooden block feet here, and that directly translates the weight of the tub when it's full of water to the subfloor underneath so that you don't risk getting any cracks around the drain. Without those feet, this ends up opening up and splitting a lot of times. And this crack here is not a crack that you can fix with the repair guy. Okay, they might come and fix it for you, but it will crack again. So the only way to avoid that is to buy a tub that has these reinforced feet. Don't rely on the skirt to take care of all the weight. You need to give support to the bottom of the tub. So the one thing you need to take care of before you start the idea of putting in a larger tub than what you have now is you need to understand which direction your floor joists are running. If you don't have access from underneath to see exactly the proximity of them, you run the risk of this. There could be a floor joist right here. And if that's the case, when you open this up, remember that your, your tub drain is going to be moving to a new center location. And if it's right on the, where the joist is, then you're not going to be able to put that install there without compromising your joist strength. And that's a brand new world. Now you can do this, but you need to get that engineered and it's a really big expense. Otherwise, you're going to have creaks and cracks and movement going on, maybe damage in the ceiling underneath. 
So the way you can check that out is go to the heat re register vent in the bathroom, put your arm down the hole and see which way the elbow goes, okay? And which way the elbow goes will be the same direction as the joist. If they're running this way into the tub, you're gonna have lots of room in your cavity to move your plumbing to the new location, guaranteed. So the other thing you need to keep in mind is the framing around the tub. Remember, when you're framing around a tub, traditionally you're gonna to wanna to have wood backing off the corner of the tub so you can attach your, your overhead shower rod or even future, if you're gonna put in glass or a door kit, you wanna have wood there. You don't wanna rely on the strength of the wallboard and the tile to support that. So we wanna make sure we reframe. We also wanna add whatever blocking at the same time for our shower features. The less work we do after the tub is installed, the better. Um, outside of that, I think if we've cut all the basics covered, make sure to check the level of the floor. When they built the house originally, it may have been level, but every house settles in the middle because it's wood. It'll all shrink just a little bit. There's almost guaranteed to be a slope. And if you want your tub perfectly level, you're going to have to do some shimming. So keep that in mind as well. So there's really three things that we need to do when we're putting a larger tub into an existing smaller hole. One is we have to open up the subfloor to reconnect the drain. Two, we have to eliminate this, all this plumbing and start all over again. And the third thing is we have to cut back the tile and the underlayment so the tub can fit in inside of that area. Like I said, when the house gets a little older, it tends to slope in the middle. And if I try to level this tub now, I'll be flush on the outside wall and I got almost a half an inch gap difference here. By cutting all this back and creating a new line, I can install this tub and have nothing but a silicone joint available to the naked eye later. So what we've done is we've opened up a bit of a can of confusion here. What I thought was the pipe leading for the drain turned out to be the pipe only going to the vent. This drain pipe actually does a P-trap, comes back here, down through the joist, and then back to the drain, which, you know, contradicts what I definitely would have done as far as my process, but that's fine. What I've done is I've gone out and I've bought this brass drain kit. And the reason I bought this is because of the flexibility. I need to move my drain to a new location around here. But all of the fittings in this plumbing here are joint to joint to joint. And although I'm able to take that off, it's just really labor time consuming. So this enables me to change from this pipe over. I can put on this new T that's a brass, put this pipe to where it goes center. I can come off the existing pipe right here and I can actually snake in the corner of this pipe here which is awesome. So I can get that extra inch and a half out of it just by bending my copper neck. This enables me to do all my plumbing, have it leak proof, and it's a lot quicker. Now it's only an extra $15 more than the ABS drain system. So I suggest buying this all the time. You don't always need to use it, but when you do need to use it, it's nice to already have it. All right, now, in order to cut this all out, I'm gonna be pulling out my handy dandy rigid inch and a half pipe cutter try to get as much of this pipe cut as I can and you just stick it on the pipe it has a sharp tooth on it and it slices through the ABS you know if I'm lucky I put it right up to the fitting go at it from both directions it'll almost complete the cut now the secret to doing good plumbing is cutting perpendicular and trying to cut in here with this saw might be a little tricky I and mean, I could always lay it right in here and fish it back and forth but it's a little too big and cumbersome. So I went out and I bought myself this cute little hacksaw for just occasions like this. I can actually get in here. Now, this is gonna take a minute. But it'll get the job done. And then once you get three quarters of the way through, it'll generally just give up the ghost. Okay, so you don't need to clean ABS fittings with sand cloth, but I can't see what's going on in behind there. So I'm just making sure that I've got any of the old solvent out of the way. So all I gotta do, generously apply the solvent to both pieces and without wasting too much time, push and twist, get that on there nice and tight. Okay, 
So now we just gotta prep up our brass drain kit. This is all compression fits with some positions there's gaskets, some of it's just thread like here. So when it's just thread, I use a pipe joint compound. This acts like a sealer. Let me put that back in where it came from. Nice and tight, okay. Now these other joints, so it's just a washer and a nut system, all right. So what we're gonna do now is just measure off where this goes, we'll loosen up this collar. When we have the ability to raise or lower this, okay, according to the dimensions on the tub, which is awesome. You'll see how this operates here. We put the ring on first, and then the washer, okay, goes in afterwards. Okay, so we slip this over, and it's a nice snug fit. And the thing here is, we now have to cut this pipe to fit. All right, that's not my final location. Before we put the lift of the tub out, we mark the center drain on the floor. All right, and so we've got the dimensions on that. It's nine off the wall and 17 off that wall. So what I do is I'm gonna go in here now. Let's see what this pipe is. That is nine. That is not 17. So in order to get it over to this location, I've gotta make this pipe shorter. So, what we want to do is go like this now, and we're measuring to the center hole. Eyeball this bad boy. Yeah, that's going to be good there. Okay, so I eyeball, that's about the edge of where my pipe goes. You can see that inside this fitting, there is room for that pipe to be extended. Okay. I'll mark it just so you can see. I have a half inch of play. So if that's what I'm guessing, I'm gonna split the difference. I'm gonna to go to quarter inch of play. I also have the ability for this to move around just a little bit on me. So that'll make it real easy to install the tub. Okay. All right, and then we just take the hacksaw and cut that off. This is one of these cases where having some sand cloth is brilliant. It makes it a lot easier to put the fitting on. Okay, so we're in. Put the ring on, put the gasket on. I mean, this is snug. It's really difficult to do with the gloves on. There we go. Okay, here we are. Now, uh, again, we're just still doing the rough fit here. We haven't connected or tightened up any of the fittings. 17 right there. And right there. And right there. Okay. Now the other thing we have to do is find out how far off the ground that tub is going to be. Because we were using this type of drain system, we were actually able to tie into the original ABS that was coming out. Um, we've locked on the collar, adjusted all of our pipes, we created our center point here of 17 and 9, and we created our center point here, just according to the dimensions on the tub. Well, the only thing left to do now is just cut back the tile. I've got a beautiful porcelain tile bit on here. I picked this up in my uh, tile supply store. Cost me 35 bucks. You can get something comparable in the hardware store for about 60. And uh, we're just going to run the vacuum and cut this out. Make sure you protect yourself because you're going to have flying stone going everywhere. Hit it. Material. That's good. There, I like that. So Max just gonna install some vapor barrier here for us. He's got a great little trick it looks like for doing this if you're a little short. There you go. Hey, I like that. I'm gonna use that one day. 
So we have got our extra framing in the wall. We've got our drain done. We've got our floor cut back so that we're ready to drop the tub in. So we're ready to install our tub finally. We've got our plumbing rough in tied into the wall. Our drain is assembled, our floor is cut back, our framing is done, the vapor barrier is intact. And we're gotten all this point without expanding the scope of work outside of the fact that we had to cut the floor. So, so far it's a good day. All right. Now, there is no one way to do this. You are gonna have to do a little bit of trial and error. Just remember the back side and the, the each end are open. So you have the ability to do a little bit of twisting and rolling when you're trying to get these into position. The key is to hold it off the ground the entire time until you're ready to set it down the last few inches. So you don't accidentally put too much pressure on one of the corners of the skirt, which will always be visible. And if you break that, you gotta go buy a new tub. Okay. There we go. So we're flush up against this. And there's our drain. That'll be perfect. This is on the flexible connection, so we can put that in place later. So now that we have our tub in place and we're solid, we want to connect all of the plumbing before we connect the tub to the walls. And I'll tell you why, because the plumbing has only got so much flexibility down here. Um, I want to get this one mounted, the drain, and then I want to connect the overflow, which is on the flexible neck. So that'll work out really well. What we got is you got to take care of one thing here, and that is this protective plastic. And now I'm only mentioning this because everybody who's ever got into building things and putting in plumbing for the first time, until you've had a leak and you found out it's because of this plastic was in the way, you don't know that you need to remove it. <laughs> so I'm going to save you that problem. Get the plastic out of the way. And you don't want to have any of that protective plastic where you're putting your fixtures. So you want to get your white silicone that's designed for kitchens and baths and you want to get it on your thread here in a couple of lines and you want to put it just a thin layer around the seal here on their first attempt of doing this series of plumbing in the bathroom we had a few plumbers come in and they chimed in with the fact that this particular style of acrylic tub is not conducive with the old-fashioned plumber putty and apparently there's some concern that the putty will break down the acrylic over time so they suggest using this the bathroom silicone so now you take your tub tool and we're causing compression on that rubber gasket that's underneath up to the tub surface I'm just going to lift that up until it's nice and tight. Here we go. And once we have it snug, we'll throw a screwdriver across the top and give an extra, extra half a turn. All right, now at this point, wipe out the extra silicone. It's not necessary to be in there anymore. Now we got that one done. I always put my drain cap in right away, make sure it's covered up. Now, here's my overflow, and I'm just going to reach in behind. I'll put my gasket back in place now. Very difficult to install the tub and not knock this off. <laughs> now, you can see I'm a little bit low. I'm just going to tug on that neck extension until I'm right where I want it. And this is where this kit comes in real handy. A lot of overflow systems um, have a little bar and you tighten it up with a drill and you just got to get it in the right spot. And you may or may not have it good contact. This one actually has a threaded cap that goes over top. And so this one here gives you the ability, just go backwards until you feel it sit in, and then you go forward. That way you won't cross thread. I'm actually not in there right, there we go. If after you turn it a couple of times and it's giving you a lot of resistance, you might be cross thread. So just back it off and try it again. Now you can use the tub tool here as well. Okay, as a screwdriver, you can see on here there's a couple of prongs. Gives you something to tighten it up against. And you're just going to find that middle point. 
And because the back of that overflow is flexible, it'll not just move up and down, but also twist side to side so that you can get a perfect compression right there. Okay. Now, if at any point you're concerned at all about leaking, you can, as a management tactic, you can actually silicone around that. This plastic to the acrylic can be siliconed and create a secondary seal. But the finish on this actually has this really cool little thing. It's a little different look from OS and B. And it has a slotted groove that goes over top of the edge of that. Now, how sleek is that? Not seeing any screws. Very sexy. Now, it's inevitable whenever you're installing a tub. Um, one of the things we joke about in our business is we never find a room that's square. You'll never find an alcove that's square. So once you've done, drop in some shims all the way around the tub. And that is where you will put your screws to attach the tub to the wall. Once you've done attaching it, cut off the shims, remove them out of the way. If you're concerned at all about uh, the acrylic breaking, you can actually get a pilot drill and just drill a small little hole before you put your screw. I suggest flooring screws because they're coated and they won't rust as fast. Um, but if you really want to go crazy, you could always buy stainless steel. And here we go. Once we've got that all set up, that's more than one shim thick. <laughs> here we go. These are actually ACQ. These are deck screws, but they'll do the same thing. And you'll see we get started and it'll drill its own hole. And you can run it almost flush, okay? Don't go too crazy with this because you will crack it. And that's all you need. Yeah, perfect. So once you get that in, Here we go, now we got it as tub is installed. Okay, so in the building world today, we've got a lot of different materials available for building and waterproofing a shower. Uh, I believe in one of our previous videos, we showed you how to use just regular drywall and use the curdy membrane, that orange mat, and cement that on the walls and create your seal for waterproofing. But in this video today, we're gonna to show you a little different system because curdy makes its own wall panel. And this is half an inch thick. It's a polystyrene, it's got the waterproof membrane on it, and it just reduces everything down into one step. One of the benefits of this board is that you can actually use it to create your own custom niche and you can cut the hole after you've installed your wall while you're tiling to create that shelf right on the grout line. We're not doing that in this particular project. We'll do that again some other time for you. Today we're just covering how to install it and the basics of it. So this stuff comes in three foot by five foot panels or four by eight foot sheets. I've double checked, it's available at both of the major building stores. The only downside is neither of them carry the Curdy Fix caulking. So if you download the instructions or look online for how to do this properly, you're gonna be disappointed. They do not carry the caulking. I'm not exactly sure why. It's not exactly needed, but we'll leave that to Schroeder to answer that question. So what I've done is I've just pre-cut my panel. I prefer to buy three four by eight foot sheets and because when I do the math, I have a five foot and then a three foot, a five foot and a three foot, and then control wall. So that's three panels, it's nice and simple, and I never have an issue. If I buy the three foot by five foot, I've gotta buy three sheets just for this wall, because usually this wall is six feet and change, and that's maddening. All right, now here's the deal. This board is, cut it five feet and my hole is a little bit bigger and that's fine. They come with hardware, this wonderful little clip system and that clip right there has got teeth in it, okay? And so what happens is you put it on the polystyrene, you press it in, the screw goes in the middle, into the stud and then it, you screw it until, until there's a depression, all right? And the way this works is that depression gets filled with cement and a waterproofing membrane layer, a little two by two square, and that is the entire system. As soon as you put that on, this is built like a submarine. It can go 10 stories beneath the ocean's level and no water's gonna get in there. Now these clips are supposed to be installed every 12 inches on the stud, every 16 inches apart. Your bathroom may or may not be framed like that exactly. Not to worry, it's a very rigid board so you can get away with a little bit of slack. Now, 
in our particular case, our framing is quite odd because we are back to back showers here. So I'm going to have a larger cavity. So I'm going to take advantage of this stud, even though it's really quite close. Oh, love the Phillips screws. Because these boards have got these wonderful grid lines on them, and we're just doing a substrate, nothing has to be exactly perfect. It makes life really easy. I can actually put that board there, eyeball it, mark my spot, and I can just cut the whole board without any straight lines. All right. Breaks a lot like drywall, and it just has another membrane on the back that's very similar without the lines. So you just cut it and then you shave it. Now, if you're transporting these large sheets in your car, all you'd have to do is cut across the backside, snap it over, and you can make it half as thick to shove in your car, and then you open it up to install it, and you still have a continuous joint on the membrane, which means you still have a waterproof flare. So that's a very handy trick to have. Just for get started, we'll throw a couple of washers in. Go about a foot down. There we go. I'm going to lock that in place. Time for the next board. This is an awesome way to measure. We can just go over here, identify where the other board is. And then we go over here. All right, so we just eyeball this. Take an extra quarter off. You don't need to be flush to the ceiling with your wall board. All right. It's okay to you have your board a little bit short as long as you're only doing a shower. Now, if you're sealing it all up to do a steam shower, you also have to waterproof the ceiling. At that point, it's not going to be an issue. But for a standard shower, if your wall board's a little bit short, and I say go for it, make ease of convenient. Look how easy that is to install. No fight. Put your clip right on the joint and compress the joint together. And go like that. Now, when a last step, just as we're about to tile, we're going to mix up our non-modified cement, and we're going to do a curdy tape joint along these joints here and we're going to cover all of our screws with little squares and then that's the entire waterproofing system so remember all you need to know is you keep these things every 12 inches up and down the studs try to put them on every stud that you can find or 16 inches on center use these special things at the joints and a utility knife to cut and you can waterproof like a pro so I found that one of the best secrets is get the two long walls on first, leave the control wall till last, crawl in here, and then just measure off your finished wall board to the center of the plumbing fixture, which oddly enough turned out to be 16. And because we use a laser level, all three will be the same. Now we want to measure from the top of the integrated tile flange. That is six and then 17. I want to get all my measurements at once and just have them handy. And that's 65. Now, all we're going to do is translate that information onto this board. So around here, that's my center line. That's my center line. Okay, so I'm at six inches. And I'm at 6, 17 inches, and I am at 65 inches. Okay, so now I've got all my measurements. All I need to make my holes is a utility knife. Now, if you like, you could use a hole saw. <laughs> Seems a little extreme, and I'll tell you why. Up here, we're going to have a shower head. And it's just a half inch pipe coming through the wall and the water starts here and goes down so the likelihood that up here gets wet very very small so you can cut yourself a nice moderately sized hole just to, for convenience sake okay and there we go that's for the shower head down here i've got a shower control now my cover plant pan is about five inch round and it has its own gasket that seals up against the stone so I'm not really that concerned about water getting in behind that part of the wall either so I have a rectangle that I want to cut that is about three by three inches that's where I'm going to start
Okay. And then for the tub spout, of course, same thing. It's just a half inch piece of copper. And so just to help make it simple, I'm going to cut about a one inch hole. And then we're just going to slide it all into place. Now the secret here to knowing where your wood is, is you go down to your tub and you just look for the screws because that's not just attaching your tub, that's marking it. Alright? And that is how you know where your stud is. So I only have a screw here and here. I'm going to fill those two lines. I'm going to screw the outside edge as well. But because the old drywall is sticking out a little bit, I'm going to take a minute with my utility knife and cut that back before I close it up. And tighten it up till it dimples. There you go. So now all I have to do is go along, finish all of my screws every 12 and 16, and I have to cut a couple little strips to go beside the tub down to the floor. Oddly enough, that is the one part of the bathroom that seems to rot out the fastest. It's the most important. So make sure you keep some spare material around just for that position. And once we mix up the cement, we'll show you how to waterproof this. So here we are, we got all of our board installed now. It's all the clips are in. You can see where we use the clips on the joints so you can kill two birds with one stone. The only thing that's really left to do is to finish the waterproofing process by closing up these joints so that they're waterproof. Now, if you're not familiar with the Schluter product, this is their joint tape. It's kind of similar to doing drywall. Really, we're gonna just cover it over. Now, you need to use the right kind of cement. And so with anything that's waterproof, it means it resists water. I want to use a product that is going to um, get harder and harder and harder over time the longer it stays wet. So since the water isn't going to get absorbed into the wall, I use a non-modified cement, which is old fashioned for cement. <laughs> and I use that to make all these adhesions because I found that trying to use any other product, it just starts to peel off. So I know Schluter makes their own all set product now that's good for any application. That's rather expensive. You can just buy a regular boring non-modified cement and it'll save you a ton of money. Really simple. This stuff is actually, um, uh, it is a plastic, it's a woven cloth, but it's difficult to cut with a utility knife. So be really careful. You're actually better to use scissors when working with this kind of stuff. And of course, if you need to know how to mix cement, you can check out some of our other videos we've done on the Schluter waterproofing system and tile videos as well. Now, let's get into this. This is really kind of straightforward. I'm going to actually demonstrate back here. Now I installed this board a little bit shy on purpose, okay? As a demonstration, this is not meant to be rocket science. Really, we're just gonna put this membrane up to the ceiling and we're gonna just physically measure it right down to where it overlaps right down to the top. And like I said, this stuff is a little tricky to cut. Yeah? So you might wanna use some scissors. The idea here is that we install this. We want to have it come down over top of the integrated tile flange, all right, so that our waterproofing goes right down and diverts everything right down to the tub deck and then into the tub if any water gets in behind the wall. So just as a note, if you're buying this stuff at the local building store and you don't want to spend a lot of money on tools, you can just use your regular four inch knife. Just apply it pretty liberally and don't try to squeeze it out when you're putting it on. Now Schluter does make its own tools so you can get all the thicknesses exactly correct. But honestly, as long as you're just a little liberal with this, you'll be just fine. Now you take your membrane cloth and you fold it over in half and just run it off the tub a couple of times. And that is a great way to put a seam on that cloth and it'll aid in the installation so you're not fighting with it the whole time to put it into the corner. Then you can just place that in there. Bam. Just to reiterate, the waterproofing system operates because this product and this product both repel water. So water can't force itself behind that joint once that's dry. 
there's just not enough space for water to get a foothold. And they've tested this stuff out something like four stories beneath the ocean floor and the amount of pressure it takes to force water through that joint. And since we're not in the ocean, we'll be fine. So the recommendation from Schroeder, of course, is to have about a two inch overlay. This tape is four inches wide. And there we go, that's installed. Now that joint is completely waterproof. So butt joints are pretty much the same. Of course, you're gonna make a mess with this stuff, so don't worry about it, you can clean it up later. Again, you wanna have a two inch overlap over there. There we go. Okay. Now, as far as the cost of this product is concerned, I'll be honest with you. If you're using this product, it's because you want your bathroom to be waterproof, uh, hell or high water, okay? This is, this is not cheap product, and it really works. But to give you an idea, one roll of this at 16 feet is $30. Each one of these 4x8 sheets is $100, $110. So you're looking at a five or $600 investment in materials alone just to waterproof and build your shower. Of course, if you're putting on expensive stone and you want it to last a long time, this is a great way to make a heavy use kind of shower last forever. The way that we finish the waterproofing of the system is everywhere where we have a penetration, we need to seal it up as well. And so we're gonna add the cement, put these little squares over top of the hole and press them all tight. Now that area there has the same degree of waterproofing as the joint. Again, guaranteed walk away, never gonna have an issue. Generally speaking, if you're a homeowner and you're buying this product at a building store, there's one thing you can't buy because they don't sell it, and that is the Curdy Fix. And it's an adhesive caulking. This is not it. Part of their warranty program requires you to use that at the base of the tub to seal the wallboard to the tub. Now, they don't sell it at the hardware stores. Neither of the two major brands do. So you're already buying a product that you can't get a warranty for, and so you've got to be creative to create that seal. So what I have found, and we did this on a couple of projects earlier, we made a cedar cooler for my deck. We're using the LePage 2-in-1 seal and bond. This is made for interior use, so the fumes aren't very terrible. And you can use this to seal up your gap at the, at the tub. There's another way you can do this. You can also cheat and seal up these holes. <laughs> You're going to love this. Now, this doesn't dry very fast, so if you use it, you need to give it a couple hours to dry. But I'll give you an example of what happens here. One tube of caulking is $9. One sheet of this is $30 bucks plus cement and plus plus. Sealed. Waterproof. I don't know about you, but if I wasn't in a hurry, I would do this all day long. Come back and tile tomorrow. Because the design is made for a two inch overlap at 40 feet below sea level, since we're only waterproofing something in the back of a shower, you don't have to be all that concerned with the math. If you're even close, as long as that hole is covered, even by a quarter of an inch, I'm telling you right now, you're not gonna have a problem. So don't get all paranoid about it. So since you don't have any curdy fix and you've gotta find a creative way to solve this problem, you could use the membrane right over under the tub, or you can just take your caulking here and this is, of course, a special material that'll bond to just about anything. And you can just run a nice thick bead along the bottom. Okay. Bam. And then just smooth it out with your thumb a little bit. Get a little pressure in there so you know it bonded all around the corners. You can do up the side as well. And that is it. All right, for closing up our shower, we're going to be using a 4x12 glossy ceramic tile. This is a brilliant product because it has lots of flexibility, great style, and easy, easy, easy to install as long as you can get your first row level. That is why it's very important to have your laser level handy. I can't preach enough about this. Every tool that every homeowner should have in their, in their toolbox. So before we get started, um, one quick tip. Make sure that you've peeled back your protective layer of plastic off your top ledge. You don't want to let that get caught underneath your tile or that will end up causing you problems down the road. And always have a pail of water with a sponge handy. I like to clean as I go. It just makes my life a lot easier. 
And if you're doing this professionally for people, every time they pop their head around the corner and want to see you working, it is so encouraging for them to see a nice clean job site. So the beginning of a tile job is always the same. It's called mapping it out. You need to think about how you're installing your tile. Now, our basic direction here is to start with a 50% offset. So it's a typical subway pattern, just a offset from the stack in the middle. So what we want to do is first measure our back wall off and put a center line on. And this back wall should be 59 inches. And so that should leave us at 29 and a half, which is right here. So the process here is simple. We just take a couple of tiles. We start with a grout line on the center line and we work towards the outside. And you'll see that we are left with about a half a tile. That is brilliant. And because we're staggering 50%, every other row will be half tile, full tile. And of course, the same math, if we start in the middle of the tile, we'll be left with a full tile at the edge side. So what I'm doing is I'm checking to see how level my wall is all together. And I'm going to be good there. So if I use that as my starting row right there, and then I cut a bunch of tiles in half, I can start building the entire back wall from this corner off that line. And that is brilliant. If you don't have a laser, you can always just use a regular level. But of course, this never lies. And Okay, so in this case, the right side is pretty straight. The left side actually ha opens up. So this tells me that if I'm going to go with half offset, I should start in this corner. And then whenever I get to my end and I have to cut a tile, I can always cut it to fit without wrecking my pattern. So I've also set this up here. You can see the laser line in this wall here, Max. I'll get out of the way. This is the laser level we're going to use. Now, this tub is installed flush on the subfloor and the house has got a bit of a dip, so the tub isn't exactly level. And that is not going to be a problem because this is the drain end. Now, I've got it set up for full tile here. As I come around the corner, you'll see that really soon, bam, right there, I'm already at my line. So, the way I map this out, and the reason I want the laser level here is I want to cut all of these pieces for the bottom row first to fit up against this laser level. And then I can use my wedge spacers and make sure I got a perfectly straight line here before I start building the wall. If you just start tiling and you've got a little slope, you're going to have a hard time getting all your joints in the corners to line up because the tile will be sticking in every direction as it follows the slope. If you don't start level, you can't finish level. It may not look bad to you when you're sitting in here building it. When you walk in the room after you're all finished, it'll scream at you, hey, that's crooked. And <laughs> we don't want that. Now, the easiest way to do this is just mark the wall. Okay. And then you take a look at your laser level. And you can put your tile to your laser level over here. Sorry, that wrong corner. There and here. And when you put that on the tile cutter, you just line up the two lines on the cutting line, score and snap. So now that our tiles are cut and ready to build the first row, before we get started, we want to get our plastic edges on. This will determine how, what the actual outside measurement is going to be. And really the secret here is just get a little something you can press that edging into. All right, you can attach the rest of this later. There we go. Now we can just set up our laser. Starting down at the baseboard and you can just push that over until it's exactly where you want it to be. Very nice. Now you can see the tile that we've chosen here has got a beautiful honeycomb on the back of it which means that I can go with a quarter by three eighths uh, trowel. This puts a really nice thick ridge on there. Great for collapsing those ridges and getting good adhesion. And the secret here is push that tile shut without a grout line. All right, and then you slide it into position. Now I've got a couple of different spacers here today. I've got a one eighth spacer. I like subway tile with a little bit of gap and a little bit of grout. And this looks a lot more classic. 
And then these are wedges, all right? And these wedges are designed to help get this perfectly level and also create a little bit of a gap between the tile and the acrylic tub. Remember, acrylic, when it gets full of water, is going to be bending around a lot. So you don't want to have it in direct contact because it'll cause squeaking. So we just put a wedge underneath, create that airspace, and we can remove later before we grow. And you can also use it to level it. And then establish your space with your spacer for your grout line. There we go. It is that simple. Okay, so because we have our edging already installed. Oh boy. Now, I like to take these little wax bits off as I go. I don't like to leave it until it's all the tiles installed in case there's an accident. Now, I'm going to be putting it tight to that and then marking minus two grout lines. All right. Hopefully, Matt, that'll cut okay. I got my son helping me today. He's doing all the cutting. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> One of the reasons why I think uh, subway tile is a perfect do-it-yourself job is because the, the tile is small enough and because it's made of ceramic, it's very easy to cut. And you can use just a score tool, which puts a scratch and then pressure. And it always snaps right on the line. Matt just did this one, and that's a really nice cut. That is really clean. All right, and you can do that. That tool is available at the building store for about $30. That's awesome. You can always get a wet, wet saw as well. But for this tile, I would use a score tool almost exclusively. And then for around this area, just get a, a ceramic bit for your four inch grinder. And you can just use that wheel and cut any decorative hole you need. And that's about the only tools you'll ever need for this. There we go. Let's add our grout line. Now you see that the edge of this tub has a bit of a raise to it, which means that I'm not level. And that's what wedges are for. So I'm going to get that line level first based off my laser. And then I'm going to use my wedges to raise the rest of my line. So the reason I switched to laser level for doing my tile is because I would end up getting my, my level so filthy from always laying it in the mud and I couldn't get a proper line unless I cleaned all the cement and started over again. It drove me nuts. So this way I have a perfect line all around the entire tub, not just from corner to corner. And that helps make sure the job is perfect every time. Okay, so we just set up our laser level down here to have a look right on the edge of the tile. And so down here, I am just, just hovering above the stone. Okay, and then over as I come across, it's, it, the, your eye will play tricks on you. I think that was level. It looked good. It was a straight line, but it wasn't a level line. So this is why these wedges are so awesome. I can actually make this adjustment until it is absolutely perfect. Okay. All right, so now we have our first row well established. I'm pretty happy with what's going on with it. Oh, my spacer came out. Remember, we already checked with our laser levels. We know that straight up is perfect. We cut a bunch of tiles in half, so we're gonna just start with a half tile there. So now, it's just like building a pyramid, right? You gotta get your cement on the wall. And this is gonna be messier than when you're using an adhesive. So always have that pail and sponge handy. Clean as you go. Try to keep the extra cement out of the grout lines as much as you can. Just run your travel along there like that. Or even both of your fingers, okay? What you're gonna do is just place them right on the tile first, okay? Start with two rows at a time here. So we just lift the tile, drop in our spacers. And because we've got the, the row all leveled off, just do the ends. You don't have to put them everywhere. Just to support the tile to keep it from sliding around. Okay, and that's it. Now, we wanna straighten out our line here. Always put your cuts on the inside, of course. Press it in, lift it up, and do the spacer. Now, getting lots of cement where you need it. I like to start at the bottom and then lift it up. So I'm pulling the cement away from the grout line. And then just do over and over and over again. Start tight to the tile. Okay. 
This one slipped off the laser. And you can keep an eye on this and adjust it as you go. After about uh, half an hour, these tiles on the wall are not going to be able to move anymore with this type of cement. Okay? So you got a little bit of time to play with this. Nice and tight. And the reason you go nice and tight, it's a great way to check to see if everything's square and level. If I put this on nice and tight, I got a huge gap. I know I've got to fix something, okay? So we're just going to set the space up. Now, for good measure, once we have our line here established, put these spacers back in too. And that'll make sure that all of your grout lines all over the wall are uniform. You don't have big gaps and little gaps opening up next to each other. That always looks unsightly. Now during the introduction I mentioned that we're doing a subway tile with the glass mosaic. So now it's time to discuss the glass mosaic and why it's necessary. Most of the tile that's produced today is produced under the assumption that you're having a five foot shower, which is why these are just under 12 inches plus the grout line, full five tiles across. Looks very aesthetically pleasing, easy to center, easy to install. Plus they're also made at a certain height so that on a traditional 20 inch tub, which is now the norm, and a regular eight foot ceiling. It's just about a full tile at the top, maybe a little bit more, maybe a little bit less, but nonetheless, it'll finish well with either a little grout or a little grind, and it'll look like a full tile after the silicone edge goes on. What you need to know is what if your situation is a little bit different and it's gonna be just a sliver? What if you end up with just one inch of tile left? What if your house is a little short or you got a bulkhead or you bought a shorter tub and the math doesn't work? How do you fix that? And this is what we do. There are bazillion options of mixed mosaic tile, different thicknesses, one square foot sheets like this with a reoccurring pattern, okay? What you can do is you just follow this simple procedure and you can use your mosaic to make the adjustment on your finish before you get there. So you measure down from your ceiling, all right, we're just a little bit over th under 32 inches. So I check, how's that going to look? Well, I'm a little bit over 32 inches to a full tile. So the tile at the very top of the ceiling, well, we'll use this, I'm going to end up cutting about this much off. In this particular situation, this tile and this tub work because I checked both sides already and on the other side it's perfect. And on the side that's inside the house, it's actually got a little bit of a gap. So I'm going to have a little bit of a cut line around the top, just like it did around the bottom. Because remember, I have a square house, and it went, and it fell in. So now all the, I had to cut the bottom row on the tile to make it level. The top will get cut to be level, and it'll work out. But if you had a problem with that, and you were going from zero to one inch filler, I'll guarantee you that one inch piece of tile would look like garbage. So... I'm going to back this up one row of tile. Instead of the 32, I'm going to go to 28 and a quarter. And that'll give me all the room that I need. That's my mark. And I want to make my mosaic that thick. So now I take my sheet. And on the bottom, I've got a thicker piece. Up here, I've got a thinner piece. So I'm going to say, OK. So I need a grout line. If I use those, it's too much. If I go here, it's too much. If I go there, it's just right. Okay? What if I started at this end of the sheet? That's not enough. So that's what I'm gonna use. I'm gonna use the thick one, two, three, four, and then I've got a reoccurring pattern here. Thick one, two, three, four. So that means I'm gonna get two linear feet per sheet. I bought a couple extra sheets because I know this usually happens. And then we are going to put in that much mosaic tile all around so that we finish with a full tile. And that is how you solve your problem. This is a great way to fill in the differences. If you're using large stone especially, you can put in two bands if you want. Now, traditionally, we put it in around five feet in the shower. Okay, so stand in the shower, measure up to five feet. It's kind of like line of sight in the bathroom, all right? So when you look around, the glass should be right in front of your eyes. That's all you need to know about mosaic tile. Of course, this is glass, so cutting this can be a little tricky. And maybe we should go to the saw and show you how to do that. 
So I'm going to demonstrate how to cut glass mosaic. If you have a wet saw, it's simple. Just set it on the table and slide it through. But if you don't and you're going to be using a grinder wheel, and this is fine, this is a nice porcelain grinder wheel. Um, the trick here is actually cut from the back side. All right, it reduces the, the breakage and the chipping on the front of the glass and gives you a nice straight line. And because I'm going into a corner, I have to have a straight line. So I'm just gonna eyeball a straight line off this short tile here. Now, okay, so I wanna, what you'll see is I'm not cutting through it. I'm pressing down the middle of the tile and it's splitting. And watch this right here. You can see the grinder only came to this point, and then it, shh, it cut right off. Okay, we're going into a corner, the other glass will come against it, and then that is all you need to do. You have to do one, two, three, probably four of these cuts for the entire mosaic strip. Other than that, the rest of these will fit together the, the way that it's on the sheet. Now, in order to cut a hole in the middle of the tile, and this is important because you're gonna be putting your tub faucet here, and the tub faucet may or may not be big enough to cover this plus the grout line, and you don't want it to be a place where the water can get through. So it's important to cut just enough hole for the pipe to come out. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just lightly touch on all four of these lines, okay? And then I'm gonna finish the cut from the back side. And I'll, if you watch carefully, I'll show you how it's done. And then when I'm done doing it, I'll explain exactly how I did it. All right, so you'll see I've started the cut on the glaze, and then what I do is from the back side, I can see visually looking at this where the line is, and I use the grinder and just make a, 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 just a quick line on the back of the stone. And that translates all that information to the back of the tile. Now I cut through from the back side. That gives me the ability to finish that cut without having the blade cross-cutting right into the over the tile. And my tub spoke connection will have no problem covering that. Okay, so right now we're gonna talk about the Curdy Band T and this particular cement and why we're choosing this for our glass mosaic. The funny thing is, glass is usually heavier than ceramic, relatively speaking. And they come pre-attached to the back of the sheet. All right, it's an adhesive. Now, a lot of times these spaces that are in between this glass are different than the spacers that you're using on your wall. So for instance, we'll take one of these. Oops. And here's my 1 8 spacer. It barely makes it in there. But if I try to put it in between all of these tiles, it actually doesn't fit. Over all these four joints, this joint spacing is actually something like um, 2 15ths instead of two sixteenths. It's a little bit strange. So the spacers are useless. I can't use them. So if I'm building a wall like this and I put in my mosaic strip, I can use a spacer on the bottom and I can stop there and I can wait till tomorrow to come back when it's dry. Or I can use the right cement that's going to hold it up there even without spacers and it's not going to slip. I know it sounds ridiculous, but when you go to the hardware store, you're stuck. You have Usually three choices of cement. There's a, um, a modified, a non-modified. Modified means it has a glue in it. And then there's an ultralight, which is good for putting tile on a ceiling. Um, where I go for my tile products, it has the entire line, the entire MAPE line of everything that's available. So I've got gray and white options of modified and unmodified for five different kinds of tile. Regular, thin set, large format tile, um, ceiling tile, ultra light. I mean, if you can dream it up, they've got the product there. So when you're shopping for your cement, if you get to a tile supply store instead of a building store, you're probably going to be a lot more happy with your result and a lot more options. So in something like this, you can tile all the shower in a day, or it can take an entire weekend. Now, if you were to put two of these glass strips in there, it could take three days, or you just buy the right cement for the job, spend the extra couple bucks and finish it all off in an afternoon. I'll let you be the judge.
Now when I'm mixing cement, generally speaking, for the first minute of mixing, I want to have a little bit less product in there than I need, just so I can make sure I can clean out all of the clumps that sit in the corners. Of course, I always add water first. There we go. Now I know that dent soup is going to be able to withstand all the rest of the cement that I pour in there. All right. So you only want to mix this once. You don't want to wait 10 minutes where you're supposed to allow it to set up and then come back and go, oh, I need more water because it's not going to perform properly for you. You've just destroyed your cement. So you want to mix it thin enough just to the point where when you travel it, it holds the travel groove, but it's still sloppy, okay? That way in 10 minutes from now when this is set, it may be a little more firm, but it'll still perform well on the wall. Now we bought this cement to use on our mosaic, but because I like to be efficient, I'm going to do the rest of the wall with it. <laughs> just because I don't like mixing just a little bit of cement in a pail. Just a little demonstration here. Ready? This is the cement that doesn't sag. There you go. Yeah, I'm using a one quarter by three eighths trowel. That's a lot of cement on a wall. Good, good adhesion, but a 90% contact just by tossing it on the wall like that, and it wasn't slipping anywhere. Great product. This is the white cement. <laughs> it looks a little gray, doesn't it? But this is the white. <laughs> and the reason we picked the white is because the glass has just a paper on it and then all the edges are behind the sheet will actually bring that color forward. So if we use a dark gray cement, your white glass is gonna turn really dark gray on you. We don't want that. Before I put the glass on, and I'm just gonna make sure that my edge here is nice and clean. And this is important when you're doing glass. Make sure that this edge here is nice and clean. We're just gonna start on the edge here. And the same as the other tie, we'll start right on the base. Okay, nice and tight. And then I'm gonna just lift it up. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use my tool to lift so I'm not pressing against the wall. I'm just gonna give it a little bit of pressure. Voila, that's not moving anywhere. When I put the tile above it, I'm gonna get exactly the same result. That's not gonna move anywhere either. I'm gonna already put my grip line there. Done, All right? And so for some of these trickier places, it's hard to reach. You can't get your trowel in and around this corner. And because I was busy building that other wall first, I've let this dry. Feel free to just add your cement to the back of the tile. Okay, be real liberal here. Hold your trowel at about 75, 80 degrees. And then just run that off. You'll end up getting the same thickness as is on the wall. Okay, just like that. Do all sides of the hole. All right. Take the extra cement off and then just fire it over there. Done. Okay, so the only other thing you need to know is this. When you're done your tile work, the next day you come back, take all your spacers out, all right? Take a wet sponge and force it in all the lines and clean them all out. The cements that we're using here, within 48 hours, you can wipe them out pretty simply and it'll actually clean up real nice without any tools or risk of damaging your tile. Also, when you're doing around the sides down the bottom of the tub, you usually do that at the end of the job. Save some of this tea product, okay, from MapPie, and use that down there too, and then you can build backwards, knowing that the tile's not gonna slip and make a big mess. Other than that, patience, 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 keep your lines level, get a laser level, I can't stress that enough, and you'll have a successful tile job too. Okay, so before we start doing this, um, let me just talk about the parts real quick. 
The Riabel Pro system comes with a surface mounted plate and this gets screwed to the roughing valve that's in the wall and it has a gasket on the back that seals to the tile. Now depending on the tile condition you may or may not want to use a silicone bead after you're done. A lot of times this sort of thing doesn't work if you're using a subway tile because there are inconsistencies with the surface texture and the grout lines. If it's a really large piece of stone and you're cut right down the middle then this is plenty enough to seal it shut. So what you have to do is you want to take your long screw, they come really big, and put it into the, the wall and just slide your fingers on it until you know the surface. That's your surface depth that you have to put the screws into. And then you go look backwards until you see the next ring. All right. And this is a soft brass and you just take your side cutters. All right. And you just give them a shot like that. And that one's cut to fit. Again, just confirm that I did that right. There we go. Back to there. And use your side cutters. Okay. There we are. And now we have our plate. So we slide it over our valve trim. And we want to do this first before we add all the other pieces. Because we need the extra light going in there to find the holes. Okay. And just wiggle it around. And just put it finger tight for now. There we go. Okay, Whew, wonderful. Next thing you want to do is put on a glove <laughs> because these brass fittings that they make for these shower valves are very, very sharp. And find somewhere to put that that's not going to wreck anything. Take out the temporary test plug, throw that in the garbage. All right, so in this particular case, and you have to be really careful to check your instructions for all these things because every system is a little bit different. In this particular case, there is an extension that goes with the valve, probably because the valve body is made really deep from this particular manufacturer so that it can handle pressure balance, multi-port, plus a thermostatic valve. So this is just an extension of this valve here. So these two pieces will sit together, and then this end here with the gaskets and the pins will sit right in the cradle. So all you do is slide this stuff in, and there you go. Once you feel it sink into those two pins, you're good. All right. Now this is just the decorative chrome trim that goes over the brass fitting. There is a hole near the front and that goes on the bottom. That's in case any water gets into that valve and it has a way to drain that doesn't go in behind the wall. All right. Another good reason why when you're installing your valve in the wall, don't be afraid to install it just like one degree slope. That way, all the water that gets into that valve will drain out of the valve. Now, there's a gasket. There we go. We want to tighten up our screws. And just snug. Don't over tighten. It's just made of plastic and you'll destroy it. And then after that, you just set this on the name of the company, Rehabel. Goes at the bottom and you snap it in place. No screws, and if you ever need to remove it, you can just get a good hold of it and give it a good tug, and it'll pop off again. So here we are. I was so focused on making a video, I forgot the most important part. <laughs> just about to turn the water on, and my brain went, wait, you haven't put the... Yeah. Look at this. If I don't put this on first, the whole valve assembly is going to come firing across the room, wreck my silicone work, wreck my day. <laughs> now, here's a... Before you pull any tools out, check the manufacturer's instructions. These guys actually aren't a big fan of wrenches here, even though it's set up for it. They want you to go finger tight for a reason. Because they want to make sure that everything is lined up properly. And you can feel it. Okay? If you start using a wrench and it isn't lined up properly, you may not even notice it. There we go. Quarter turn is plenty. I happen to know from experience that that is going to work out great. Here we go. Oh, before we put the handle on, I got to put this on again. We're doing this a little bit backwards, but this will still work. Okay. Here we go. Now the water's still off, so I can cheat. Get my set screw in there. <clears throat> I 
Okay, and then don't forget the cap so that when you turn the water on, it doesn't get all wet. And it'll look pretty. Hot and cold, on off. That's simple. All right, we have our faceplate, our handle, and our little set screw cover all in place, so we can leave that for now. Let's move on to the tub spout. Now, the tub spout, of course, is a, uh, let me just pull it out and I'll show you this unit. It should be a slip-on. Yes. Now, before I went and did the plumbing for this bathroom, I inquired with the company because I didn't have the finishing trim on hand, and they assured me that it was a slip-on. And so that's why I ran a half copper and put a test cap on it. And of course comes with its own Allen key, and that's the set screw for this. So you have to back this one off. You'll see it comes fully inserted. That'll drive you crazy trying to push that on the line. So just back that off until it's out of the way. And now it's ready to install. Okay, Get the handle. And we're just gonna take a little pipe cutter. Now, the slip-on starts here, and there's lots of room in that pipe all the way in. So you can see, we're good to go. So what I generally like to do is I like to cut it as far out as I can here, around three inches, in case you ever wanna change that to another system and you need to have the ability to, to solder on a male thread. Some of these fixtures that come, they have a threaded pipe in here. So this way, if I leave a little extra pipe and I've got to solder on a connection and do any other plumbing at another date, the option's there for somebody. If you cut too far back, it just makes it really difficult to fix it later. Not every company does everything the same way. So it's nice to leave yourself options when you're working. You'd be surprised when you're in this business how often you'll get a call from a client five, 10, or 15 years later and they want to just make one little modification or a couple of changes or even six weeks down the road. Now this has got a little bit of water in it. I drained the line so it shouldn't be under pressure. There we go. Of course, remember, we're gonna be using our silicone when we're done the finishing trim. So as soon as you can get that water cleaned off the grout so that it doesn't absorb too much, the better. You wanna have that grout line as dry as possible when you go to silicone so that you know it's gonna stick. Before you put your fixture on, grab your sand cloth. And just give the edge a quick buff. Okay, if your edges aren't too sharp, it's not gonna wreck your little gasket in here, and it won't hurt your fingers either. And you just force that one on, okay? You wanna just make sure that the name is up and everything looks square. Reach underneath with the Allen key. Find that little spot. Okay, there we go. Remember, these are all plastic parts in there, so don't over tighten. Just make it nice and solid. Here we go. What's that old song? Two out of three ain't bad, but we're not done yet. This is the Rebel Pro two jet shower head. They have a three jet shower head and rain shower head options. And it's just manual control right here, right? You gotta love it. Wow, that is some good looking shower head. Okay, so this particular shower head also comes with the arm and there's a little flange here as well. And this is nice. It comes with a sticker to tell you which direction the water should be flowing which is kind of funny because traditionally the longer part, piece of pipe does go in the wall and that's kind of normal. So <laughs> it's, it's nice to see I've been doing it right all these years. Okay, and so this is nothing simple. It is nothing to this. This flange is really basic and it is just a compression fit. Okay, you just want to wiggle it on and there's little teeth on the back that have been kind of snapped out of the tin. And so you put that in there like that. Okay, and you're, you're good to go. Now, hopefully I don't get soaking wet here either. Oh yeah, mm. here we go. Well, if you haven't seen the project video and you aren't familiar with these, I buy these at my specialty plumbing store. And this is the same size as this pipe, but it has a little gasket on it. So these are temporary that I put in there. That's a shut off system. It's also a identification system for installing wallboard and tile. It's exactly the same dimension as my pipe. And so when I install this, I know exactly how to make my cuts. 
So these tiny little flanges that they come with, when I go and install that, it covers that hole perfectly. No guessing. Love that. Here is my system now for installing the shower arm in your wall. Okay, you want to take your Teflon tape and you just roll it around three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ridiculously ten times around. And I'll tell you why. I'm paranoid. I'm doing a compression fitting inside a wall cavity and after I turn the water on, if it doesn't work, it'll leak and no one will know until it makes a big mess on the ceiling downstairs. And because I'm paranoid, I'd go a little overboard. I also like to take a little bit of this thread sealer paste and run it up onto the female fitting inside the wall. So now I've got two kinds of seal that are going on in here. Here we go. Okay, now here's the secret. Go backwards a little bit until you feel it sit in the, in the room. Okay. Now, this is going to be snug right out of the gate, so it's hard to tell the difference between cross-threaded or just <clears throat> installed brass on brass. Now, you want to fight with this until you get it in there. <clears throat> Perfect. It's exactly nice and tight like I like it. However, it's pointing up at the ceiling, so we have to fix that. So, these shower arms are not made of metal that won't break. <laughs> so you have to be gentle and careful with this. But I like to get a little extra leverage on this. Instead of holding it here, I like to hold it out here. So I'll put a screwdriver right in through the whole turn and use my hand on the pipe. <sighs> okay, now the shower head, it has little flat pieces on the neck here. That's for a wrench. It's amazing how many people will call and complain that there's a little drip of water coming out of here and going right into their tub, oh my. But it happens. Now inside here there's a gasket, okay? So that should work just compression fit, finger tight. All right. So once you think you got it figured tight, reach in behind there, find those little flat sections, give it a couple more turns and try to get it on there as tight as you can. Now, at this point, it should be pretty much sitting on that gasket. And the way you make sure that this is done is you grab your wrench, set it on the flat pieces, okay, and you give it a couple of turns. But make sure you're only grabbing the flat pieces of that shower fixture. All right, so now we've got all of our fixtures installed. It's time to clean up, do all of our silicone, and then we can actually test all of this system. Water's automatically going to the tub. Perfect. Okay. So we're pretty much at the last stage of our project in this. We've done the tub, the shower, the tile, the fixtures. We're all done. So now it is time to do the silicone. This is the last step that we have to do to finish inside the tub surround. And there's a few tips and tricks that I'm going to share with you. So follow me along as we go through this. When I'm doing a tub shower, I always want to have two types of silicone. One is a clear and the other one is my white or the color that matches my stone. Uh, if I'm going with the natural brown stones, of course I use the beige. There are grays and there are, if you go to a nice supply store, you can get silicone in about 15 different colors, okay? So don't be afraid to shop around and make sure you're gonna get the look you want when you're done. But because we have a glass mosaic, I'm gonna start with my clear silicone and we're gonna do all the clear silicone areas at the same time and then we'll switch it all over, okay? So here we go. First, remove the tip. <laughs> Now my caulking gun has a cutter on the side, makes my life simple, boom, done, all right? And then I also have this little wand that's attached to it. It's a little filthy here, but, and that is used because the tube itself is sealed and I have to puncture the seal so that I can have the silicone be released. And once I'm done, it sits back on the handle, put it in the cradle and line it up.
Now, I cut it on a bit of an angle on purpose because I find it easier for installation. One of the things you need when you're silicone is you want to have towels around, okay? You want to keep your hands clean and keep your area clean as you go. Now, because we punctured it with a dirty stem, I'm just going to start off by cleaning it out and making sure what comes out of the tube is exactly perfect. Now, because it's glass mosaic, if I use white silicone here over top of my grout, I'm going to get a really uneven, nasty line on all my glass. So I'm just going to start right here and I'm going to just run a nice little bead to there. Okay, I'm going to put my dry finger on it. And as soon as I feel like I'm getting a lot of buildup, I'll pull it off. All right. Done. That's simple. Again, in this corner, just a little bit of pressure. And this particular gun, when I let go of the handle, I have to put a thumb pressure here and that releases the pressure inside the tube so the caulking should stop coming out. And we'll just start with the dry finger. The other place I need clear silicone is on my fixtures to my tile wall. Now, depending on the stone that you use, you may or may not need to do this, but because I did a subway tile, I have a little bit too much texture on the wall and too many grout lines interrupting my installation. So I want to make sure that the water that's running down this wall can't get in behind my wall. Now, I don't need to go all the way around, but I want to just start at the top with a dry finger. Of course, wipe that on my towel and then come the other way. There we go. Now, next thing I want to do, get a new towel. I'm going to show you my little trick here. Wrap your finger in your towel and set it on your plate. Use your other finger against the plate. Pinch your finger and then just run it around the plate. Okay. What this does is it makes sure that it cleans the silicone off of the chrome nice and tight to the wall so it has a good looking finish. So we also want to do the same thing to our tub spout and here we are again. We don't need much. There's not a gap here really but I hear a lot of people get quite concerned about this scenario and they're probably right to be. I mean even though we have a waterproofing system there are holes in the wall and this is the most common penetration point is around the fixtures. Just a little bit of pressure here. You don't want to put so much pressure that you wipe it all off. And you, at the same time, you don't want to leave it on there either. Okay, now. We want to clean that. Similar system for wiping that off, only this time, while I'm holding the towel, I pinch my finger and I stick my other finger out and I use it like I'm scribing. Okay, there we go. Now remember when you're buying your silicone at the store, if you're going to the building store, they have usually three kinds, all right? They've got um, uh, kitchen and bath silicone, and then they have kitchen and bath mold and mildew resistant, and then they have kitchen and bath mold and mildew resistant, but it's really awesome and it's going to last 20 years. I have never seen a bathroom that had caulking that was 20 years old that didn't need to be replaced, so I don't spend the extra five bucks for something <laughs> that tells me it's going to last that long. I only get the 10 year. And the caps snap right back on again. Yeah, no, don't lose your teeth. It is only plastic though. I mean, really. Now, now there's a lot of debate about siliconing a bathtub. Uh, I've seen people say you shouldn't grout the inside corners. Don't grout the tub to the tile wall. Shouldn't be grouting to the ceiling. I like to do all the grout get it all sealed up because when I silicone I only do one application I don't want to have to put so much silicone in there that it's just making a huge mess I don't want to have to tape the ceiling and tape the walls so if I grout first then I have a backing for the silicone to bind to so what I do make sure you wear your shoes when you do this or you'll slip right off in your socks start from your inside corner with your tip angled like this so when I'm applying my caulking I'm pushing it out in front of me but I'm not scraping it off the back. I'm going to just leave enough there that I'm filling the hole 
and really this takes a little bit of practice to have the right amount of pressure. If you're not comfortable with this, you can always tape it and then you can wipe it and then you can pull the tape off later. But this is the best way to do it. Right here. Okay. Again, dry finger. And really, I'm just connecting the ceiling to the wall here. And that's it. I'm feeling there's too much. Okay, so I want to have my rag with me. Come back. If you have to leave and come back again, come back a couple of inches and gently into the corner and slowly apply your pressure again. All right, bam. Okay, so generally I'm working my top down, okay? I want to be able to clean as I go. And I start in the corner and I pull and I clean. You can see the difference where the cocking isn't where the cocking is. It's a very easy visual thing to manage. I'm going to get my tip proper here. There we go. You just run it along. Move the cocking gun just a little bit ahead of the cocking. And now you always wipe back towards where you were. Just like doing drywall mud on your ceiling joints. So what we're doing here now, this side of the wall, because the room wasn't level and square, I have a pretty significant grout gap. And when you only silicone the grout to the ceiling but not the tile, you're really going to see it show. It'll always scream at you. So I did the top joint and now I'm filling in the bottom while the top is still wet. Blending them together here. Okay, so instead of my finger on an angle like that, I'm going more straight along now and trying to fill this gap with the silicone right down to the tile. Okay, and I don't know about you, but I am pretty darn pleased with that. Okay, the next is you're gonna bring it down from the ceiling, inside corner, and we're gonna just fill that in concave. Now there's cut tiles and different joints going on here. And remember, we have clear here. So don't run into the clear. What you wanna do is use your thumb and just push it back and start right at the joint of the tile. Okay, so visually I want my silicone to start where my tile is, okay, and even in the grout's fine, but don't bring it down to the glass. That'll just look really cheesy and it'll scream. So now start up at the top with your finger, press it in, run that down dry, done. Okay, of course keep in mind, always looking to see if the tile has been polished properly. Okay, if there's any dust on there, just take a second and get rid of it. You don't want to be attaching your caulking to dust or it'll just end up wiping away. All right, so we're done siliconing our walls. Now we have to silicone the tub. But before we get down on hands and knees, remember when we originally were working on this project, and if you haven't seen this, you got to watch the other videos, we were removing the wall without damaging the ceiling, which is tough because they had drywall tape. Now we've installed our tile and we've used the silicone on the ceiling. That ceiling's already finished paint. If you're in a situation where you have to paint your ceiling, you only have two options. You can wait to silicone it until after you're done painting, or if you're just trying to touch it up and you have silicone in the ceiling, you can actually, when this is dry, you can put painter's tape over top of that to create an edge. And then you go to the store and you buy a can of Kills, K-I-L-L-Z. It's in the paint department in an aerosol can. And you just, psh, psh, couple of quick shots of Kills on silicone, and you can paint latex paint over top of that and you won't run into any problems. Okay, so the last thing we have to do is silicone around the tub to the tile to create that nice clean joint. Now remember, it's not part of the waterproofing process, but it is part of what makes it look pretty. Now, if you are not familiar with acrylic tubs and you've only used steel, then you can just go ahead and do it. With a steel tub, you just do the seal and walk away. But if you have an acrylic tub, there is something you have to do before you silicone, and that is put weight in the tub, okay? And the best way to do that, just turn on the water and let it get about halfway full. So now the reason we have to do this is because this is a very flexible material. And although it has supports and all kinds of spraying underneath, if I was to demonstrate any other technique 
for a large majority of tubs that are sold out there, you're gonna be very disappointed. Not every tub has as much support underneath it or as much reinforced spraying with the fiberglass underneath. So if you go to the hardware store and you buy yourself a tub and you get a great price on it, it's probably because when you fill it full of water, it's going to sink, okay? And it's gonna pull away from the wall a little bit. And so if you add the silicone when it's empty, when it pulls away, it'll break the joint on you and then you'll get all the water and the dirt in behind there. And even though it's waterproof, it'll start to go ugly because it'll trap all the colors from the dyes and the shampoos and the dirt off you. And then before you know it, a couple weeks goes by and your silicone joint looks like garbage and you got to do it all over again. And that's a lot more work than doing it right the first time. So same kind of process. We're going to set our gun into the corner and we're not going to add too much. Like again, I've already grouted that joint and I've grouted the joint because I use a tub that's reinforced and it has feet and I know it's not going to be moving around too much. So I'm not going to get that breaking out. Take my cloth, set my finger in the corner. And I was feeling a lot of silicone there. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there was too much. So what I do is I push against the back wall and not on the bottom. And I just clean up the edge. Here we go. Now a lot of this is just experience. But a little bit of practice and you can get really good at this. I would suggest if you're going to do a renovation project like this, before you tear it all apart, cut out the existing silicone on your ugly tub and tile, and then try sealing it again just so you have a chance to get some experience with the product. That way when you're ready to do your finishing work, you already know how kind of pressure to use and how comfortable you are with this kind of process. Now this is incredibly important here. You get good pressure on this silicone because this bond is part of your waterproofing system. This is not just for being pretty. Most water that penetrates between the tub and the tile is in this wall area right here. And there is no waterproof joint after the silicone between the wall board and the tub. Just a nice light bead. And leave a little bit of a dollop at the top. Of course, you now the pressure I'm using here, I want to actually feel the tub and the tile with my finger on both sides. And then rock around the corner here. There we go, nice clean look. Okay, we got one more rag going on. I can't stress the importance of having clean towels around. Toilet paper also works, but this is nice and durable. Okay, so now we're ready to do the last joint, which of course is the tub to the tile. Make sure you vacuum clean, make sure there's no dirt, and the same thing, okay? You wanna just leave that bead really consistent here. Move at a nice consistent pace with consistent pressure and you'll end up with a great result. Okay. Now this is part of the waterproofing system. This silicone here is actually going to keep the water from getting between the tub and the floor tile. So I'm actually trying to force it in the gaps out here. And that's why it takes a little bit more effort to get a good look because I'm actually forcing it in there pretty tight. I'm getting it up the side of the wall of the tub and all across the floor. So like I said, it's a little different process here. Okay, this time I'm going to put all the pressure on my finger on the floor and not on the tub just so I can move that line back. And you can only do this with a dry finger. If your finger's wet, you're just going to smudge it around and make a mess. So remember the last thing you got to do is take a look at your wall tile and your floor tile and think about the water that's going to potentially be coming over here especially if you got young ones having a tub in here seal this area as well just a tiny little bead so it's almost insignificant okay and there's two things you're doing here one you're getting rid of any little gaps and cracks in your finish so that it always looks pretty this is also cosmetic but by filling this up with silicone you're also waterproofing this joint. Okay, so that's about everything you need to know to apply your silicone. Uh, again, the steps are pretty basic. Um, lots of pressure. Make sure you fill your gaps. Make sure the surfaces are nice and clean. And then let it dry. Don't be in a hurry. Most of these silicones you want 6, 12, even 24 hours. So read the instructions on the can. They'll all have that information there. Let all this sit with the water in the tub overnight for sure. And then maybe in the morning you can come by and drain it. 
and wash it all up and see if you've missed anything. If you've missed anything, you want to get this, the touch-ups done within 24 hours, okay? Uh, if you let it totally perfectly clear and then you add silicone on silicone, it doesn't bond very well. So the next morning is the time you want to have a look. If you got any air bubbles, go address them right away and uh, your bathroom will stay nice and dry. So in this video, I'm going to share a construction cheat with you so that if you end up chipping one of your existing tiles and you don't have any more of those around, there is a way to repair it. It may not be perfect, but that all depends on how good an artist you are. So here's our chip. The story is this. We did a great job doing a demolition, and then the client ordered a tub that was bigger than the hole, so then we had to use our grinder to cut back the tile line, and that went perfectly. And then Maddie, my son, was cleaning up the subfloor, and of course his hammer hit the edge of the tile and caused the chip. So not everything goes perfectly all the time. And I'm going to show you my little trick for fixing this up. When you go to the hardware store, you can actually buy porcelain glaze, these little, little bottles, okay? And you go down to the tub section, and they usually have a little display, it comes in a little white box, and they have all the different manufacturers that they carry, and they have a porcelain glaze. Yay! What they don't have is gray. So then you go to the paint department, and you buy a can of gray stain. Okay, and you get a couple of tools in a cardboard box and you mix all these together. Now both of these are oil based, so I have gray tile, I grab the gray stain. If you have a different colored tile, you can go to your Michael's paint department or something like that. You know, you can get some oil based paints in all your different colors. And you basically take your paint and you mix it up with your glaze until you have something that looks a lot like your floor tile. Now that's probably just a little bit light still. I'll add a little bit more of my stain. There we go. Now generally you're going to want to do this in about two applications. Come over here. And a little dab will do. And you want to just use your little tool. Fill it right up to the edge where it chipped off the glaze. So you're getting the color of the stone and the glaze. Okay, there you go. Now if there's too much of it, just take your flat tool, pull it back. Okay, the only thing left while it's still nice and wet is take a little bit of a paper towel and just buff in the area around the stone that's not included with the chip. Okay. Voila. Now it's not perfect, but it is a lot better than that chip that was there two minutes ago. Now the little, little bit of glaze kit here, it comes with this little handy dandy piece of sandpaper. <laughs> and what you do is you give this about an hour let it dry, come back, and you can sand it down nice and smooth. And if you like, you can mix a couple more colors at this point. Put in a little bit, of, little bit of a darker color, and you can mix up a little bit. You can even get an artist brush, okay? And you can just dab in a little bit of that two-tone texture on there. And you can spend as much time and energy as you like, with as many coats as you like. Just make the serious sand between coats. And when you finally get the one you're looking for, just walk away. Now you're sealed up, and that floor is waterproof again. <laughs> So most people, they have a damaged piece of wallboard, whether it's a renovation like we were doing here behind us, where we have a bit of a seam issue, or they've got a doorknob dent in the wall, or they're just going to repaint a room, and they've got little pinholes from where they had pictures and screws and plugs. And so I'm going to share with you my secret today for how to fill all those things. And the reason this is such a huge secret is because it fills it super fast. You don't have to sand it, and you don't have to prime it, and you don't even need to use two coats of paint to finish it, all right? This is my secret in the trades for whenever I've got to do a touch-up and I'm ready to head out of a project and I see something I don't like, I can take five minutes and fix that before I walk out the door and it doesn't need any work after I'm done. And here's the trick. You gotta own a hawk on a four inch knife. All right, so go to your store and make sure you buy them. So what you wanna do is you wanna grab some Sheetrock 45, all right? Now this is a, quick drying drywall compound. It comes 
in powder form and you've got to mix this yourself. All right? And you take your hawk and you set it over your sink and you just want to make a little bit of a volcano here, okay? And this is easier to do with a lot of it, harder to do with a little. But you really want to set up a little bit of a volcano. Okay, there we go. Now, before I get started, the secret here is hot running water. Make sure you get the water running first. And once it's hot, bring it into your volcano. Now this is going to take a little bit of practice to get used to how much water to put in there. Now, you want to hold it, and you've got a couple options. You can leave it on there for about a half an hour or so, but it'll harden faster than you can mix it. Or you just take your knife and off the edge, lift up some of the loose powder, and shake it in there like you're icing a cake. Okay? Work your way around the volcano. Ice your cake. And if a little bit starts to come out, don't worry about it. There's not enough water there to cause a problem. Now once you've gone all the way around the edges, it should start to become more of a paste. Okay? And then you can just break it up and you mix it in. Right here on the hook. Okay? No mixing tools, no pails, no muss, no fuss. Right here on your hook. Use your four inch knife. And just work this in. Now, it's more of a paste. Now you just want to flatten it out now, make sure all your bumps are out of there. Okay, the smoother this is when you put it on the wall, the easier it will be to finish. And you just check right there like that. Yeah, I'm loving it. So now I've got a drywall compound that's got a hardening agent in here that's chemically activated. And anybody who knows any science knows when you add heat to any kind of chemical reaction, it speeds up the reaction. And that is why we are using hot water on this. So generally, a 45 minute mud with regular cold water takes 45 minutes to an hour to set up. But if you add hot water, you can be sanding this in 20 minutes. If you add a really hot water, or if you live out in the country and you got lots of minerals, be careful because this can set up in five to 10 minutes. Okay, and so then what we're gonna do is we'll just show you, we'll apply some of this mud here. And so this is my finished coat. All right, nice and tight. And I'm really pressing this on here. And the goal is to fill every little scratch, every bump. Okay? So that this wall is nice and smooth. This particular wall had to be resurfaced with a new corner because we changed the tub. And I just started working on this this morning. This is now the third coat of mud I'm putting on here. Okay, there we go. Now that is going to be beautiful. You know, we try on this channel to show people all the tips and tricks for doing the work themselves. And remember, even the most complicated project still needs to have simplified finishing. All right, so here we go. Just going to double check, make sure everything here is good. We got any bumps, any bubbles. This one was done earlier. I've had a lot of people comment on the, on the channel. Um, you know, can you do wet sanding? Is there any way to keep dust down? What if I'm just doing a small space and I don't want to make a mess? This is the system for you. So you just take your sponge. You get these at the building store in the tile department. This is for actually doing grout. And I'll just demonstrate here real quick. This is mud that's just been pressed on. It's got the wrinkles. It needs to be feathered out. Okay. And you just give it a wipe. There you go. Let it dry. You're ready to paint. I know it's that simple. <laughs> Once again, you know, just go around your fixtures, take the excess off. If you see any ridges, just wipe them out. There you go. Ready to paint. And the best thing about this 45 minute mud is even after you get it wet, because it has a hardener, it'll dry in just a couple minutes. So if you want to get a job done in the same day, you can take a whole room, do all your patching, and then you don't have any priming to do. Or if you've already finished your project and you bump a wall with your ladder on the way out, you can do your 45 minute mud, put it on there real quick, give it a few minutes, even take a hair dryer to help dry it off, damp sponge, okay, come back with some paint, get a little mini roller and you can touch up your paint job and walk out the door within the hour. 
And that is Money in the Bank. Thanks for joining us on this edition of How to Renovate Your Tub and Tub Surround from A to Z. We've covered a lot of information in this series, but we also have these broken down into individual videos on our channel in the event that you're doing maintenance or just tackling one small aspect of this. Um, we also have a lot of other A to Z videos now, so we've got a playlist. Make sure you check the link at the end of the video for that. And remember, if you're handling a big project like this for yourself and you have questions, go to the comments section. We're here to help, okay? Thumbs up if you like the video. Looking forward to see you on the next time.